Good morning, members. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Policy and Resources Committee. Uh, we have a number of uh, important reports to consider this morning, a fairly substantial agenda, um, which I intend we will deal with in our usual efficient manner. Um, also make members aware that the meeting is being recorded and will subsequently be made available for public listening. Um, Rona, can we have the setter and apologies, please? Uh, yes, thank you. We have apologies from only from Councillor Fairbairn today. Everyone else should be present. Is Councillor Thompson? Apologies, apologies from Councillor Thompson. Okay. okay, thank you. Item two, declarations of interest. Do any members have a declaration of interest they wish to make? Councillor Angles. Yeah, I'll declare an interest in item 12, being a contractor to the authority, but I don't think I need to leave the room. Councillor Tate. Yeah, I'll declare an interest, Chair, on uh, item 22. I'm actually a director trustee of ESDA Foundation, and I'm also on the, on the subgroup that has been taking this project forward for the last two or three years. So hopefully it will come to a satisfactory conclusion. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll also declare an interest in uh, item 12 as a contractor to the Council, but as it's a strategic item, uh, I don't think I would need to leave the room. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McClelland. Interest as a supplier to the, to the Council, but I uh, don't think there's any need to leave the room as it's a strategic document. Thank you, Councillor McClellan. Councillor Driver. Actually, I'm, I am num uh, 23 as well. I'm a non-executive director uh, as an outside body from the council, but I believe my interest is such I can stay for the uh, decision. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any others? I shall just check. Excellent. In that case, we'll move to uh, item three, which is a minute of the meeting of 22nd March 2018. Are we happy to approve? I'll take it that we are. Um, item four is Scotland's Digital Participation Charter, report by Head of Lifelong Learning and Wellbeing. This report seeks approval for the Council to sign up to Scotland's Digital Participation Charter, which is operated and promoted through the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations with support from the Scottish Government, uh, and will support the commitment to further developing digital skills for our staff, elected members, young people and our wider communities more generally. Stephen Jack is here to speak to the report. Um, is there anything you would like to add? Thanks, Chair. Uh, just briefly, I think it's a, an exciting opportunity to bring together all the digital, digital activity that's ongoing across a range of services and brigade it under the, the participation charter. So there's already 13 other local authorities signed up to it and over 500 uh, organisations in, in total. So I think it would be a positive development for the Council. Thank you very much. Members, questions or comments? Councillor Surtees. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Steve, and I echo what you're saying. It's really um, positive and exciting. And uh, I note that we've had Skype put on our tablets. And the question I have is, if I am present by Skype at a committee meeting, does that mean I am present? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm, uh, I'm, not, I'm not, sh not sure I'm the best person to answer that, but... I think, Chair, what I'd like is for that to be clarified because it's a serious question regarding the travelling that I, I do. I, I think while it's certainly separate to the, um, somewhat separate to the business of the report, is a very important issue. My understanding is that it would require a change to the authority's standing orders, but I'll defer to Rona for clarification of that. Yeah. Uh, no, that's correct. Um, we, we will be bringing a paper through standing order subcommittee, uh, the review of standing order subcommittee, just to make these changes to allow members uh, to have the use of technology uh, and to discuss the, the pros and cons of that for actual committee meetings. I think possibly what I should also say prior to bringing Councillor Nicol in is that perhaps we wish to remain strategic on this matter um, rather than discussing the individual concerns about um, individual technology upgrades. However, I don't wish to preempt you, Councillor Nicol. Well, you can be rest assured it'll be strategic. Um, <laughs> Can we, can we do all this with the present personnel, or do we have to hire more folk in to, to implement this uh, participation charter, implement the, the things that are involved in it? Do, can it be done with the present personnel? Or, that's my question, really. 
Thank you, Mr. Jack. Clarify. There's key representatives from six or seven council services who are all already on with either um, actively developing or putting in plans for the future, so it can all be done within uh, existing resources. Thank you for that. Councillor Charters. Um, in this digital participation charter, I also note that um, our present government is promoting Gaelic in Scotland, that people should learn Gaelic. But I understand that Gaelic uh, doesn't have good digital participation um, on its own. So how are we going to get around this business where we're promoting Gaelic in the schools, but it can't be used in digital participation? I can't pretend to know the answer to that, Mr. Jack. Perhaps you can help. I mean, it, because we talk here about uh, a common language, I presume that's a digital language, but uh, um, the skill number four is back to basics. We support a common language. I don't know which language that is, unless it's a digital language, which is fine, but it might be either English or it might be Gaelic. Thanks, Chair. Um, I know there was work ongoing through education and developing a, a Gaelic strategy, so if, if it's okay, I would like to revert back to colleagues and, and come back to you with uh, what opportunities may lie in terms of digital support for, for Gaelic. Councillor Campbell? Just to confirm, we're talking about Gaelic here, the Scottish Gaelic language, not the Irish Gaelic language. A useful clarification, but I don't think that we are going to have to email in it um, unless we wish to. Um, are there any other comments or questions? In that case, we can go to the record. Oh, Councillor Johnson, my apologies. I must look further oh, around. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's actually just a small point. You know, uh, we're mentioning young people, staff, and customers, but one of the biggest sections of our community that struggles with uh, digital interaction is probably older people. And I don't know, it's maybe a slightly nuanced thing, and perhaps it would be nice to recognise that and mention it. Mr Jack? Yep, no, certainly there's, there's already support out there, particularly within libraries, front of house, to support older people, and even within the community learning teams uh, as well. So when we do the work to actually sign up to the charter, we'll make sure that older people's uh, reflected within the, the narrative. Okay, with that, are we content to go to the recommendations? Um, we're asked to agree um, to our council signing up to Scotland's digital participation charter, um, etc. as outlined. Are we content to agree that? Thank you. Item five is uh, Dumfries and Galloway Council's response to uh, the Scottish Government consultation on increasing employment of disabled people in the public sector. Uh, this report provides for the consideration of members um, a draft council response um, to the Scottish Government consultation as outlined. Um, and um, James McDowell is here to speak to the report. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add? Just the fact that members are asked to consider and approve the, the response before the deadline of uh, 15th of August uh, this year. So happy to take any questions. Okay, members, any questions, comments? Councillor Charters. This is a very laudable aim, but within it I can't see where there's any estimate of what it would cost to introduce this, uh, this um, uh, the increase in employment of disabled people in the public sector. I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that at all, but I, what I am saying is we should be told and what it's going to cost the council to introduce this. Okay, Mr. Medell. Uh, through you, Chair. We can certainly uh, try and have a look at that and feed something back if, if that's possible. I think at this stage it is, it is a consultation, and I think you know it's, it's probably taking those considerations into into the point when, when we move this forward. Uh, the, what, when you look at the, the, the nine questions, there's, there's certainly the, the fourth question there, which is, which is about the performance and trying to set a target where you could, where you could move this forward. And I think what, what it says within the report there is about not putting that target in place, but having a, a monitoring and review, which we currently do on a regular basis. You know, we, 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 we report to uh, full council 
uh, twice a year on, on uh, mainstreaming reports. So I think it's about further developing that. We've, we've already put in place quite a lot of uh, stages uh, with regards to the uh, disability confident employer and, and moving that forward as a leader. So I think these are good value points as we, as we move forward as a council. Yeah, Councillor Charles, um, you wish to come back? And, uh, I, I understand that. I've read the report. But what I'm saying is, um, laudable as it is this, there's going to be a cost involved from what you're saying is what the aim is to do. There always is a cost involved. And, um, of course, we've all read the papers beyond here and, and seen the parlour state we're in. And what I want to make sure is that we can afford to do what, 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 what we're proposing. Otherwise, it rather wastes your time. We can't afford to do it. So I would like that reassurance of where the money's going to come to come from to introduce these new policies. Councillor Driver is energetically trying to catch my eye. Yeah, yeah, right I, now. I, I mean, I can understand where Councillor Charles is coming with the cost and things and things, but we have to do equality assessments now when we're doing employment uh, screening and things like that. So we actually do it at this moment with um, anybody that's disabled under equality laws. There, there will be no extra cost. This is a consultation at the end of the day. So the, the employment legislation, which gives equality and things like that, we, will, we already have to do anyway. So there will be, no, as far as I'm aware, there will be no extra cost in this. Appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Councillor Surtees. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just looking at question 8A and the answer 8B. I just... Um, want to know what measures we've put in for the invisible um, disabilities that there are for our employees and in fact in my experience some people find it difficult to communicate that they have a disability. Yeah through you chair and I, I, absolutely I think that uh, is a valid point uh, that uh, it's hard you know you can see there I think the last mainstreaming report it was 1.9 percent within our uh, Staff and complement are saying they're disabled, and I think that's you're right. You know that's a, a small number, and you know what's the hidden hidden point there. So I think it is about that creating that culture, creating that culture of where you know we have certain uh, phases within even recruitment where we, we you know we ask questions about that. You know, and, and it's obviously up to the staff member whether they come forward or not. But I think it's about creating that culture of where staff feel free to to, to actually come and say, and then we can put in the reasonable adjustments or, or whatever is required moving that forward. But I think it is about continuing what we're currently doing, about creating that culture of, of trying to help our staff come forward where you know, help and support is required. Councillor Campbell and then Councillor Nicholl. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think this consultation is really, really important because it's important that our organisation um, the people that work within the organisation reflect the, the communities that it serves. I'm just interested in question four that it makes a reference to targets. And in, in the, the response, you refer to question seven, um, which relates to um, the, the employment rates within the public sector. Now, it, it, it says here that um, the working age client group who, who claim benefits um, is reported as being 0.8% with disabilities, and the council workforce comprises of 1.9% of employees who have disclosed a disability. I'm sure that the figure will probably be higher than that. How, how do we compare uh, with other public authorities in terms of that figure of the percentage of people who have disclosed they have a, a disability? Again, yeah, uh, I've got the table here actually just uh, just on that, uh, and it's point point nine for Scotland, so so that's that's the sort of there, and it's point eight for Great Britain. So I haven't got the detail of each local authority, but certainly for Scotland, it's point eight uh, in DNGs. Okay. Yeah, Councillor Nigel. Thanks, Chair. Um, it, it, in question four about setting a a target. I've always found that setting targets focuses the mind, and you've got to be realistic. It's got to be a realistic target. So I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that we're not setting a realistic target for for our employment rates in this. So I don't know what the answer to that is, or why why we've decided that down to go down that road. But uh, I think it might be a reasonable thing to think about it. 
I do take the point, and the question arose with me similarly when I read the proposed response, but I suppose, and perhaps they do, I suppose that it might be difficult to set a target when it would appear that our employment rate is roughly double um, the reported um, uh, rate in the wider population. Um, but is it 0 0.9 versus 1.8? Um, or the other way around, I should say. I, th I think it's maybe difficult to apply a target to that. I mean, on what basis would you necessarily do it? Um, in my view, the, 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 the consultation probably strikes the right balance at this point. It's not ruling out the possibility of targets, but potentially at this, at this stage might be rather difficult to set one that actually is meaningful. Um, I, I think on balance, it, it, it came down on the right side of the, uh, the argument, but I'm certainly happy to... Um, to hear other views. Councillor Campbell. Thanks. I, I think it's a relevant point to raise, but I think if you look at the, 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 the procedure and processes for um, going through the, the application process to join the organisation, it makes it quite explicit that there are um, protections for people with disabilities um, and to ensure that they are treated fairly um, and that we have a, a, a council that is representative of the uh, disabled community. Mr. McDowell, you want to come back? Through you, Chair. Yeah, it's just a, a wee point, really. The, the mainstream report that uh, came up to committee in March 2015 reported uh, 0 0.095. Uh, so that was 0 0.095 for uh, staff within within the council. And as I say, and it's, it's now 1.9. So you can start to see over the last couple of years there's been there's been that gradual increase. Uh, and you know, I think I think that's maybe why we're saying at this stage it's it's maybe too soon to, to, to put a target on it at this, at this moment. Councillor Nicholl, you want to come back? Could I, could I come back? Could you, could you just repeat the, the numbers for Scotland and for the UK again, if you could? Yep, so uh, Scotland was 0 0.9 and Great Britain was 0 0.8 and Dumfries and Galloway is 0 0.8. We are the same as Great Britain. Right. Councillor Ferguson. Okay, if... Uh, sorry, Councillor Chartres, didn't see you. Uh, on page 19, there are... There are so the second lot of bullet points, halfway down the page, the last bullet point um, hasn't completed the sentence, so I don't know what the ability is we're looking for. If you read the sentence, brings additional skills to the business, such as the ability. But I don't know what the ability is. Can we clarify that, please? Yeah, I think instead of there, it should be there. Sorry. Just a typo, it should be there instead of the. Okay, Councillor Ferguson. Thanks very much, uh, um, Chair. Uh, Jamie, d does this take into account conditions that have quite recently been now are now considered as disabilities? You know, so we've got some members of staff who've been with us for quite some time with particular conditions that weren't disabilities in the past and are now recognised disabilities. So, have we kind of upgraded this in any way, or how, how we do do that? Yep, through through to you, Chair. Yep, absolutely. And uh, you know, even with our uh, Councillor Ferguson, even through our uh, occupational health provision, uh, you know that can be that information can be can be trapped as we go forward uh, with our staff using occupational health. Okay, members. If there are no further comments, we'll go to the recommendations. We've been invited to consider, which I believe we have, and approve the response to the Scottish Government consultation as detailed in the appendix. Are we happy to approve? Take it, we are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item six is the occupational um, road risk policy report by Head of Enterprise and Services. Uh, this report sets out for members of Council's new occupational road risk policy. The Freezing Alibi Council is committed to ensuring, as far as is reasonably practicable, the health and safety of all its employees, including teachers and members of the public, who could be affected by work-related driving. Gordon Bryce is here to speak to the report. Is there anything you would like to add? Uh, morning, Chair, members. Nothing further to add for me. Uh, happy to take questions. Okay, we'll go straight to questions and comments. Councillor Maitland. 
I'm quite intrigued at how the council is going to um, uh, sort of monitor the whole business about whether one feels tired or not. I have to say, I think I feel tired the entire time. So, <laughs> how exactly are we going to deal with that? Page 28. I sympathise with the feeling. Sorry, I never heard that. On page 28, at the top of the page, bullet point one, at the end of that sentence, it suggests that we're not to drive if we feel tired. That's right. It might, it might sound something simple to regular car drivers, but um, pretty important if you're driving an HGV um, or a bus or a minibus uh, full of kids. So it seemed that um, sort of uh, safe driving in, in that sort of categories of vehicles. Yeah, Councillor Driver. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. It, it, it's, you know, I'm all for this, this going forward, but there, are, there may be one, certainly one concern that you have uh, in all of this is that you know, when, when we, for instance, take lease cars from, from the Council <coughs> and we fill up with diesel or we're supposed to fill up with diesel and things like that, we have to put in, for instance, the mileage that's actually in uh, the, the operator's book and things like that. However, on some occasions when I've had a lease car, the mileage has not been uh, correct in, in actually entering to the diesel. Now, if, if I was to fill in the incorrect uh, mileage, for instance, and we have a uh, road traffic collision, that um, permit or that road licence uh, that piece of policy that requires us to drive lease cars, for instance, will be taken into consideration when we um, have, have an, a, a road traffic collision. Hope, 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 I'm hoping that nobody ever has a road traffic collision, but if, if that would be the case, I presume. However, on, 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 there has been on occasions where the road mileage has been wrong, and I want to know what's, what things are being put in place to ensure that proper mileage is recorded when lease cars are being booked out. Uh, through you, Chair. Um, I think on the, on, when you see the scale of the amount of drivers, we've got 3,000 live drivers. Um, when you're fueling up, it's manual entry. We're never ever going to, everybody's never going to put that in um, correctly every time. Um, however, if it was an RTA or something like that we were talking about, we do have tracking systems on the vehicle. Um, that'll get in there within the canvas system, within the vehicle software, so that'll give us a, a specific mileage at any time, um, at any period that, that, that we want to see that. If you do have the wrong mileage, it's a simple phone call into fleet and we could reset um, the meters to reflect the same as a car. Okay, Kelly. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just to check, I mean, the policy only extends to elected members when they're using council-owned and leased or hired vehicles. But uh, I was just, um, the, presumably the Requirement to maintain business insurance actually also extends to elected members when using their own cars on council business. And it's maybe something that elected members need to, you know, be aware of. So if they're using their cars on, on council business, they need to check their insurance policy and ensure that they do have business insurance. Uh, through you, Chair. I mean, that, that's probably an issue for, for um, the council's code of conduct. But what I would advise, if you're driving on council business, you should be covered with business insurance the same as um, a grey mileage user within the council has to have the same um, valid insurance. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, mobile telephony, handheld telephony. Um, using your mobile phone while driving a vehicle is a, a criminal offence. Um, but, you know, often these incidents uh, may only be uh, observed by one person. Therefore, you know, criminal prosecution is, is unlikely. <laughs> Could you just give me some reassurance that if, if, if you received an allegation that a driver had been seen using a telephone, um, a handheld telephone, what the procedure is, how that, how that is managed to ensure that the safety of the passengers in that vehicle or the general public is, is protected? Again, you're, you're talking about a council employee in, in a vehicle using a hands-free yeah. device. Um, it's very much dependent on the evidence that's presented to us um, and that would be, be taken under investigation in, in individual cases. Um, it, it's a difficult one to manage. Um, our insurance stipulates that there's to be absolutely no use of 
handheld or mobile devices while driving council vehicles. Um, and again, that's a, another reason for this policy, so we can get this out there to to to, to users and drivers um, to firm that up. Um, but it, it, you're right; it's a difficult one to manage, and it would need to be be, be taken on, on each scenario on that scene. Councillor Campbell, you wish to come back. Thanks, Chair. Just as a, as a quick follow-up, um, fully understand that. But if a second allegation came in, if a third allegation came in, um, you know, what what can be done to to ensure protection of the, the public? Again, that's where the, the disciplinary process would be invoked. Um, if the if the de evidence was shown and the investigation was was, was taken that way, then disciplinary would uh, definitely be invoked. So. Okay, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just a couple of small points that come. It large, the first part, one largely leads from the point of the employees being legally responsible for the vehicle or the plant that they're using. Um, in the policy, I'd, I don't see anything that's telling me what sort of uh, training people get to spot these defects. Um, also, is there some sort of pro forma thing they've got to complete? And as you know, someone could leave a vehicle overnight and it's perfectly safe when it's left, and then they come in in the morning and the tyres are down to 10 PSI or something. So how do you facilitate people carrying that duty out? Um, I don't see, a like I say, any vehicle defect reporting thing. The next thing is when it comes to people using their own vehicles, I, th I think just to say we've told you you should have business insurance while you're working, you know, doing your work with us, I'm not quite sure that's enough, I think. I think we need a regime to check because you could get the situation where someone's on council business, has, a, has an accident, and discover that they're then uninsured and then the next port of call will be for the injured party or whatever to come back to the council. It is a, the the grey fleet or grey mileage as you called it is a huge problem throughout the the fleet world and it's something most people are trying to shy away from for those very reasons because ultimately the liability could could land with us. And the next thing I wondered was how many of our vehicles are tracked to, to make sure that they're driving responsibly if they're uh, behaving correctly as councillor driver I said as well that's the kind of thing that can help to tie up mileages because you know when the vehicles are being used okay mr price uh, through your chair um first of all the, your first point that the policy is designed to to be able to be read and not to be too heavy um there is supporting policies and, and processes and in, in behind it um, that would go through the level of, level of training that we do for, for defect reporting and the processes that, that, that help support that. Um, there's, there's a driver's manual for, for every category of driver, um, which, which are, are issued to all employees and, and all drivers for them to read. And within those other manuals, everything that you spoke about there is within that. Um, as far as grey mileage goes, if you're, if you're claiming grey mileage for the council, you have to provide us with yeah, a copy of our insurance, um, a valid MOT, uh, before we authorise you to, to make those claims and, and be able to drive the vehicle on council business. Um, Tracking-wise, about two-thirds of the fleet at the moment are trapped. Not everything needs to be trapped, but we're working through um, a bit of process at the moment, a project to get everything um, on, on the books within the tracking system. So pool cars, HGVs, buses, all those types of vehicles are trapped. Okay, Councillor Crothers. Thank you, Chairman. Just a, a small point, a couple of small points that have already been touched on. I thought it was interesting that what Elaine brought up in regards to the, the business use uh, for, for members, but for my, the councillors are the council. I think we're employees as well, so I would have seen that this can apply to us as well. And on page 23, I did notice in the last bullet point in regards to the first section, it says maintain business insurance if you're using your own car. So I, I just wondered clarification. Does this actually uh, adhere to, to the members as well? And on page 27, and it refers to the employees, so the start of that paragraph, the fourth, uh, the third bullet point, sorry, it says the driver is legally responsible for vehicle slash plant condition when driving. I uh, Just to me, that reads legally responsible. What does that mean? Just when you, in, in layman terms, sounds like that's, is that financial? Is that just the inspection of, I would have thought it, that it would be, be the latter, to make sure something's safe before you drive it or, or operate it, depending. But I just thought that could have been a wee bit more better described, I think. Uh, through your chair, I think your first point um, 
Is it councillors, elected members aren't employees. Um, you're, you're bound by the, you're, the separate code of conduct. Um, I suppose and we are. It, it's, a diff, it's a funny position. Maybe it needs to be elaborated on. We are the council, but we are employees as well, almost like a director of a business. They're still an employee. So this may or may not be the case that it applies to us, but if it does, so it's only clarification on that point. The, the difficulty we would have um, is that we have no, we've no means of policing this policy within elected members unless you're driving council assets. Um, what I would say is this policy is good practice. Everything within it should be followed, um, but I can't enforce that or, or the council can't enforce that on elected members unless you're actually in our owned assets. Um, and, and there was a second point, I think. Sorry, your second point? It was, just, it was a description, page 27 and the third bullet point. It says that we are responsible, the driver is legally responsible for the vehicle stroke plant condition when driving. It just, it's a level of responsibility. I thought that was more about inspection and safety and so on. Um, the level of responsibility there is if, if you're driving a car it's a, or, or a bus or an HGV, it doesn't matter what it is, you're bound um, to carry out a, a daily check or a pre-use check, um, tyres, oil, um, the, the legal things that, that, that you would in your own car. Um, if the police stop you and, for example, you've got a, a bald tyre or an illegal tyre, the, the driver's responsible for that. Um, the council won't be charged. The driver will, will receive endorsements on their licence and, and likely the, the fixed penalty. Um, so we, we're just trying to emphasise that to drivers. That it's, it's your legal responsibility to make sure that vehicle or piece of plant is safe prior to using it. OK. Councillor Maitland. Councillor Maitland. Thank you. The point's been covered. OK, Councillor McClelland. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I would, I've seen a number of these um, occupational road risk policies in my time, and I would say this is quite a robust policy. But I'm quite curious, and I think it picks on Councillor Maitland's point about the feeling tired. I've actually seen in policy documents restrictions on the amount of travel time that an employee would actually take, and that, that takes away this... Um, the decision from the employee, for instance, say someone's maybe having a meeting in Dundee and they could be leaving at five o'clock in the morning, travelling to Dundee, an all-day meeting, then travelling home at night, three and a half hours or whatever. I've seen policies where it's been quite prescriptive in what's acceptable and unacceptable, and I don't see anything in here in relation to driving times. And um, I think if you take a comparison to, say, during the winterisation problems we had, it was quite easy to control the the guys that were out in our vehicles and our trucks doing the work, they were working on the tackle on the time, and it was it was easy to uh, restrict and uh, enforce driving times there. But I think in general that's missing, and I was wondering, is there something like that in the driver's handbook or in the employee handbook? Is that taken care of at all anywhere? Um, I'll come back and clarify that for you. Um, I, I would like to say that it's covered within the, the driver's handbooks, it certainly is if you're an HGV driver or a bus driver and it's pretty clear that you're under domestic rules um, and you're bound by those if you're driving that category of, ve category of vehicle. Um, on the, on the, your, your average B vehicle driver or your car driver, I, I can't answer that honestly. I would, I would need to look back in the policy to see if it was covered. Um, but it's a fair point and I can come back to you on that. Okay. Councillor Charters. Uh, on, on page 29, uh, the directors and heads of services are uh, showing what their responsibilities are. And I notice that the last billet point there says, ensure that all vehicle plant and small plant are procured through fleet services. Well, I ask, why do they have to be procured through fleet services? Because I wouldn't think that that would give best value to the council if we're being so prescriptive that we can only we can only procure our vehicles, plant and small plant, through our own council. I think we should be on the open market to go and buy vehicles and plant so we get the best value for it. My understanding would be that fleet services would procure vehicles through the open market. However, I'll seek clarification on that. Uh, through you, Chair, it's, it, it's quite the opposite. We, we provide best value for the council um, when we're buying assets. Um, Purely because we, we manage all 1,500 of them. Um, we know what department's requirements are. Um, if, if a, a, for example, if a department's looking to, to purchase some vans um, and there's another department losing vans through EVRS or, or whatever it is, those vans can be transferred. If 
departments had the freedom to roam and just buy what we like, um, we would end up with a, a huge fleet, a huge cost and a massive inefficiency. Um, so we streamline, streamline that through procurement standing orders and through through my team. Hope that is helpful. Councillor Nicholl, was it on the same point? Not really. I just was wanting clarification on grey mileage. We've heard grey mileage being mentioned. One of my colleagues said, what's grey mileage? So could have some clarification on that, it would help. Uh, through you, Chair, grey mileage is um, basically what an employee claims uh, for, through driving their own car. So if you drive 10 miles in your own car and, and, and you claim back from the council 10 miles times 45 pence. So elected members, through you, Chair, elected members' mileage is grey mileage? That's what I would class as, yes. OK, Councillor Ferguson. Um, that's if they grey, of course. Never mind. Um, Not yet, but I might absolutely. be getting it. <clears throat> Some of us are. Um, the, the question I've got really is at 3.1, and it's about the prohibition of phone use. Um, surely that doesn't mean whether there's in-car telephony it allows, uh, allows that to be done legally, because we can't, that, that reads there as though you can't actually use Bluetooth in your car. And the problem with that is, of course, we've got a number of staff who are in dual roles who can hire vehicles from other major bodies about the town who do have Bluetooth in their cars. Uh, available in other fleet cars. So, um, do you mean all phone use, or do you mean just non-in-car um, telephony phone use, or uh, i.e. illegal phone use? Uh, through your chair, no, it means everything. Um, that there's nothing that can be described as legal to use. Um, if the police see you using um, even what's built into your car and they class you as not being in control of that vehicle, um, they'll they'll give you a fixed penalty if, if they feel it's appropriate to do that. Now, again, I'll go back to my point, is we're managing over 3,000 drivers. It's a massive amount of risk. Not everybody is a good driver. We'd be naive to think otherwise. Um, so we have to cover everybody the same on one generic policy. Um, it's also a stipulation within our insurance um, that, that all in any use is, is prohibited. So that, it's non-negotiable, unfortunately, um, via our insurance. Come back in. So that means there are teams who are in joint teams who can access vehicles from the NHS, can't drive them. Is that what you're saying? No, my understanding is they couldn't they can use drive the them, but They just can't use mobile devices whilst they're driving if they're under the employment of the council. And the definition that extends to grey mileage as well? Yes. Probably, probably better get rid of our um, uh, hands-free devices then, Councillor Ferguson. If there are no other speakers, um, are we content to go to recommendations? Uh, we have considered the uh, occupational road risk policy as detailed in the appendix. Are we content to approve it? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Okay, item seven is a review of our substance misuse policy, a report by Head of Organisational Development, HR and Assets. This report sets out for members' consideration the Council's substance misuse policy, which has been reviewed in accordance with the Organisational Development and Human Resources Policy Development Framework. A policy development group was established which included managers from all directorates, along with trade union representation, in order to consider the terms of the revised policy. Policy has been refreshed to ensure that it is fit for purpose and reflects current legislation. Uh, the policy forms part of the Council's health, safety and wellbeing strategy and uh, is regarded as a positive and constructive policy for dealing with employees uh, and, and any potential alcohol and substance misuse um, problems. Um, Stuart Clanagan is here to speak to the report. Stuart, Paul, I beg your pardon. Who writes these things? I should know you by now. I mean, I've only known you for 11 years. Can you introduce your colleague as well, Paul, with my apologies for having got you wrong? Chair, can I introduce my colleague, L.K. Astley, um, who was uh, instrumental in, in getting the, the policy agreed with trade unions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to the report before we go into debate? Chair, I think most of the, the detail is within the report, but I'm happy to take any questions. OK, in which case we will go straight to members' questions. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Chair. I think there was just one area in, in the 
on page 37 where I sort of had a, a problem. With, it's my understanding when we're currently doing disciplinary procedures and sort of any uh, aspect of there, there would be two managers present at a meeting. Here, um, that there's a suggestion in 3.2 that actually you could have a, a sort of similar um, atmosphere of meeting, if you like, where there's, where there's not two managers or, or two supervisors there, and it's in the wording of 3.2, it may also be appropriate to request um, I wonder if that should be changed to it is appropriate um, to have two managers there when, when this type of discussion is taking place. Paul, any comment on that? Chair, I'm happy to take that as amendment. We can reflect that in the guidance that we produced on the back of the policy. I, I think that would be sensible. I suspect it might meet with um, broad support across the committee. I would hope so. Uh, Leader, you're indicated next. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. It's such, uh, again about page 37, uh, paragraph 2.4. Um, I would suggest that in the second last line, the phrase, or immediately before, be deleted. Um, it could be where an employee has a substance, alcohol or substance misuse issue, uh, it is being picked up at work or being questioned at work. Is, is, is the uh, stimulus for that person to recognise that they do have a problem and seek assistance? So I would hope that the council would be able to offer the... Um, environment where employees are able to acknowledge and address any issue and seek advice and treatment, that that, that could be offered to employees immediately before the requirement for testing for alcohol or drugs. So if somebody is questioned about whether they've been using alcohol or drugs and at that point realises, I have a problem, I need to address it, that that should not be denied to them at that point. Chair, I'd be happy to amend uh, paragraph 2.4 to stop after the words advice and treatment. I think that would be welcome as well, actually. It is a very good point. Councillor Maitland? Well, it's, it's really rather similar. It's going on from um, where the leader is saying, it's 2.5, um, where the council will treat sympathetically requests from help from employees with an alcohol or drug issue, but not, not after an accident or incident has occurred. So it's not absolutely clear to me, if I was reading that, whether they will be, it will be treated, whether the request will be entertained, or whether it will... <laughs> would be entertained in an unsympathetic manner, just the way the wording is written. It's not entirely clear what's being said there. Chair, the, Paul, the, the essence Clarkson. of the policy is to be first and foremost supportive, so we wouldn't want any wording like that to, to cast any doubt on the fact we would be supportive at all stages. Okay. Uh, Councillor McClelland, you're next. Thank you, Chair. I was just like to ask the question, within the review, did we look at introducing a random policy rather than just cause, which I would suggest this is just cause? Oh. Chair, very much so. Um, however, that was eliminated at a very early stage. Uh, there's no other councils in Scotland that are actually doing it on a random basis, and the trade unions were vehemently opposed to us doing that and we thought, with, with good reason, um, we, we can be quite practical about this and tackle the issues more as they arise and feel that's a more effective way of dealing with it. Okay. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think it's a, a, a very uh, important policy, um, and I, I think it's, it, it's significant because it can have implications for an employee, uh, for their health and well-being, but also for... Um, other employees and the general public. Um, just cause, I, I, I feel that that's going to be a, a, a difficult <coughs> criteria to articulate. And my question is that, I don't know if it's Paul or for um, the, the chair, but will the guidance that's developed that flows from this um, policy come back to committee? Um, because I think in terms of just cause, it's important that, um, that is very well crafted. It would not normally be our intention to bring back the guidance, and we, we do actually revise the guidance to uh, keep pace with change. However, we, we will have guidance from occupational health in terms of all of these factors, and we would do it obviously hand in hand with occupational health as far as administering the policy is concerned. Councillor Driver, I think it was the same for yeah, that, that's very well. I mean, I've this year's healthy working life champion. I, I mean, I'm, I'm glad this has actually come come towards us, and, and I think 
suggestions so far are, are, are you know, consistent with what's been said in the Healthy Working Lives Action Group. I do have sort of one concern that comes along to what um, Councillor Campbell's actually just said there at the moment, and it's regarding training of managers and how we actually take this policy forward. Um, training on this type of thing happened in a workplace that I was involved in, and it was actually training in a classroom, making sure managers understood their responsibilities, accountabilities of that. Training could be read this policy, and I wouldn't expect that to be the case. I would hope that line managers would be getting proper training for implementation of the policy and the guidance that should come thereafter. Paul? Uh, Chair, I can give uh, absolute assurance that we're actually in touch with our occupational health provider and we've recently changed provider and an instrumental part of their introduction is to provide the trainer directly to managers on this. So we've actually agreed that as part of its introduction. Good, thank you for that clarification. Councillor Ferguson. Um, thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, just a couple of things. If I can quickly refer to 2.5, um, whilst I'm generally in agreement with what uh, you've got there, Paul, I think there's something that's just come to me here is that there should be an exception, and that's if it's a court order. Because if it's um, if it comes uh, through the court system and they are required to attend counselling, for example, then we should be supporting them through that counselling. Um, and I'm a bit happy if, if, if members were in agreement we just incorporate that in, because I think it is it's a, an exception because we can't expect members of staff not to comply with the legal obligations. So um, I, it was that. The second thing, it's the a bit about the procedures and documents and refer to in 3.3 .3 and um, uh, the guidance and everything else here. And I think Archie and a couple of others have touched on it here is the procedure documents and the, the training programme. It would be really helpful, I think, for members to actually see, uh, not to interfere in that, because that's very clearly a management role, but to, to see the actions that are being taken, just so we can be reassured. So um, I'd be willing to put a second recommendation there and ask, actually, actually that's reported back maybe in six months' time, once it's in place. Okay, thank you for uh, that, Councillor Ferguson. Um, Ron, are we any advice on um, just the, the interaction between the policy and any 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 decision of the court? Yeah, I, I just wondered if uh, chair if, if that amendment was necessary because I thought we had removed the wording, but not after an accident or incident has occurred. So we would be treating them sympathetically um, in terms of the request. I mean, we may not treat them sympathetically in terms of if, if we're taking a court action against them, but uh, we would certainly treat the request for help sympathetically and I think that's the point that members uh, were making there so I think if if the wording that was suggested earlier uh, to be removed is removed I don't think we need to perhaps go into whether it, it, it's a court order or not that's why you're the lawyer not me I'm sorry. okay councillor Nicholl yeah thanks chair um in page 32 3.7 to further support the council to maintain the health and safety health and safety of its workforce, managers with reasonable cause to suspect an employee is unfit or unsafe to undertake their work will be able to request that the employee takes a test. Do we have people trained, qualified, etc., to to carry out these tests? And if not, who would have to do those tests? I believe it's in the report, but Paul, if you can clarify. Chair, I can confirm that uh, this would be done via occupational health and we've actually got those arrangements just ready to go. Okay, members, if there are no further comments or questions, I'll go to the recommendations um, and we'll go through these quite carefully because a couple of suggestions for textual amendments have been made. Um, We've been asked to consider which we have done and approve the substance misuse policy. However, it's subject to a couple of uh, agreed changes. Uh, I wonder, um, Lorna, if you could just take us through them so that we can be clear what those are. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the first amendment is at paragraph 2.4 to stop after seek advice and treatment. The second amendment is to agree to clarify paragraph 2.5 and I think Rona clarified, and that was to remove the words that are in brackets. And the third amendment 
amendment was at paragraph 3.2, which was to change may also be appropriate to is appropriate. Hey, members, just for the avoidance of doubt, can I make sure that we are content with the policy with those amendments? Councillor Ferguson, you had a, a, a request for a, a second um, recommendation. Um, well, that, exactly, because the, the, this is likely to be or could be highly emotive, and I think uh, we just need to be crystal clear. I think um, for the officers to bring back some form of pro progress report on the procedures, the uh, procedural documents that accompany this, um, and also the training program that's in place and the uptake for that. Because I think, um, is the training, for example, mandatory? I think that may be something Paul and I we need to take on board and discuss with the trade unions and uh, come back to us. So um, I'm happy if, um, if we get some sort of progress report, say within six months or something like that. Okay, Councillor Campbell, you want it to? Yeah, thanks. <coughs> I, th I think that proposal from Councillor Ferguson um, sort of chimes well with me in terms of my original question about coming back to the committee. And, and it's not uh, an issue of wanting to interfere with the operational uh, delivery of this as policy. Uh, but it's just a recognition of how significant a policy this is. It's a, it's a major change. Um, and I think it would be helpful for members to be cited on how that develops. Okay, I, you, I think I've summed up exactly what I was going to say. I, I, I think it's certainly not um, any um, willingness to, to, to interfere in matters which are properly those for officers, um, but recognition that it is a significant policy and we wish to be sure that it is right. Um, Lorna, have we a form of words for that? I think I've picked up um, the point made is that members have requested a, an update report within six months on the progress of implementation the development and training of the guidance for managers and with the trade unions, the um, usefulness of the materials and the appropriateness of how they've been deployed, any incidents of the application of the policy, and to make any further recommendations in, in regards to the policy implementation. Are members content with that? Thank you very much. Thank you both, and my apologies for having got your name wrong again. OK, members, item 8 is the Corporate Revenue Outturn Report 2017-18, report by Head of Finance and Procurement. The purpose of this report is to provide members with an overview of the Council's financial performance for the year ended 31st March 2018. Um, it uh, provides an overview of performance against budget for each of the Council's services and also provides details of year-end balances and earmarked or committed amounts. Appendix 1 to the, budget, uh, to the report provides a summary outturn statement which outlines net expenditure against budget for each of the Council's services. This statement highlights that, with the exception of EEI, services have successfully addressed the significant challenges they have faced during the financial year in terms of containing spend expenditure within reduced budgets. More detailed information on each service's outturn position will be presented to the relevant service committee, along with information highlighting the key issues for them to consider. Uh, these are summarised within the report before us today. Gillian Ross and Paul Garrett are here to speak to the report. Is there anything either of you would like to add? Okay, we will go straight to members' questions and comments. Councillor Driver. Chair, uh, obviously there's an issue within the e &I and and e and i committee met not that long back there to look at a plan to improve the situation uh, within e and i and, and there's been some good work between officers in finance and e and i to get that action plan in place. Um, obviously, there, there, there's, there's some issues that um, will come back to the e and i committee uh, in July, uh, and, and, and I'm pleased to see that this, the recommendations are actually here to help that process along. Uh, so I'd so be happy to go with the recommendations on this one here. Thank you, Councillor Drybrook. Uh, Councillor Brody. Thanks, Chair. Um, recommendation 2.2 says agree the non-recurring application of unallocated budget pressure, uh, nine, £953,000. Can we be sure that these are non-recurring uh, uh, expenditures because I feel that these some of these might come back this year or in future years? So perhaps an insurance on that. Uh, if we look at page 41, uh, the fifth, fifth line down, the road's trading services, the £385,000 shortfall there on our expected income. I think we need, I think we need to look 
uh, have more scrutiny of the of the contract we had with Transserve to repair the trunk roads. Uh, do do later on the agenda we have item twelve, the contract supplier management strategy. Did this contract follow that? Are there lessons to be to be learned from this? How could we do all this work and not get paid for it? So, is there a is there a more substantial report available on this, or can we have a more substantial report on this to see how how this happened, why it happened, and how and what lessons we we've learned from this project, this contract? Okay, let me try and take these in order. Um, the, the funding is non-recurring if it's agreed by this committee. Um, the measures that will have to be taken in order to ensure that it's not required in the future will be a matter for EEI. Um, I, I think at this point, an assurance that um, it, 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 it won't happen again is, I guess, almost like asking if we can um, possibly have sight of next week's lottery numbers. But um, I, I would suggest that the work that will be done in the committee will make uh, it much less likely that it occurs in the future. The intention of the recommendation is that this is non-recurring funding. Um, we are, as I understand it, no longer uh, in the contract in question, which would suggest to me that it was probably quite a good idea uh, to take the decision we took at the budget in order to exit it. Um, as regards a fuller report, um, I think I would wish to be advised whether this committee is the most sensible place to take that. Um, perhaps seek governance advice on that point. I think it would uh, be preferable that that would be for EE and I to, to consider rather than this committee. Chair, I can confirm at the next com next committee there will be a fuller report on the EE and I progress and the plan to improve the situation within EE and I, which is is, is uh, between the director and the finance department, how we're actually going to try and improve that that situation as we move along. And I think if Councillor Brodie had actually listened at the last E and I or E and I before, he would have realised that that plan was actually in place. Councillor Brodie, you wish to come back in? I always listen to E and I, especially the chairman chairman of that committee. Uh, just because we say it, just because we say it's not going to be a recurring expenditure, doesn't mean it's not going to recur because because. Uh, the things which happen, which we which we uh, have to respond to at the time. Uh, I think, uh, I'll ha with the assurance that there'll be a more full report on this item uh, to the E and I, I'm quite happy. Obviously, as the Policy and Resources Committee, we are the overarching committee, and we have to scrutinise what the the service committees do and have an input. So, I think uh, if we have a full report to E and I, that would be that would be great. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Brody, Councillor Carruthers. Thank you, Chairman. It's funnily enough on the same point, but I'll not be overly critical, but just I know it's in 3.8 and 3.9. It refers to the overspend that's there, and it, within the recommendations, and then a report's coming back to you. I think it's a proper place, personally, myself. I do think it's a proper place, but it's from, I suppose it have to, you, you're leading this, Chairman, because it's the points that Councillor Brodie brings up is relevant in regards to the actual robustness of that report and our policy and resources. If we're funding it for a year, this committee funds it for a year, say, OK, this is a one-off, get, get your house in order, uh, that directorate, then from that point, how do we reassure ourselves that that is a robust, the members on EI can make a look at that and take consideration of uh, the information in there, but it's for years it's been an, uh, an overspend in regards to certain departments within there. Uh, that needs to be addressed, and I think this is the this is it. it. This should be it. It should be absolutely, listen, we have to cut a cloth. We've got a budget within that department. We've got a budget in other departments. It is the only one. I'm not being critical. I'm just talking as a matter of fact. So I think from, maybe when I get the recommendations, Chairman, uh, you could take the lead in regards to that, but we need to be reassured for sure that uh, uh, this is not, this does not reoccur next year. It's absolutely the end of, of end of the line for, for that, that directorate. I, I do take the point that's being made. Naturally, it is difficult to predict what the future holds, and, and there is a directorate in which there can be unforeseen um, circumstances. Um, a run of bad weather, for example, would be more than sufficient to place drains on the resources of, of that department, although that may not necessarily um, and, and will, will not necessarily un underpin the, the full reasons um, for the, um, the overspend that the, the uh, committee itself and the director uh, has been working to um, reduce. I think we have to separate out what is a matter for this committee and what is a matter for EEI, and you, you refer to that, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I guess in terms of the recommendations, I would wish to emphasise that this is non-recurring, um, and, and I, I don't think that can be emphasised clearly enough. It is non-recurring. 
But I think also it's important that we can do what we can within our powers, given that, as you say, we, we oversee the entire budget of the Council, to ensure that the director effectively starts the financial year um, in a good position, um, where it's able to then uh, do the work that Councillor Driver has outlined um, in order to make sure that um, it, it has a sustainable um, uh, and, and, and viable way forward. Um, but that, to me, I think is, uh, would be a good outcome for this, uh, uh, for this item. But naturally, I'm very keen to hear what members have to say on it. Um, Councillor Wilson, you were next. Thanks, Chair. A number of my, my points have already been raised, but I think the, the emphasis is on the fact it's non-recurring funding and that there's three main issues that have been identified there. And, and for example, um, the transfer contract, absolutely right to pull out. So, I mean, most of my points have been made, but I think that is the, the emphasis. It is non-recurring funding and that Councillor Driver has mentioned exactly how it's going to be dealt with. So we shouldn't see this position next year, particularly for these three um, issues, bearing in mind that there's other things that could prop up, as, you know, which is the nature of the service. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Councillor Charters. Is what concerns me is a, is the is a change in in the sort of attitude. We've always been very. This council has always been very very careful about the way to spend money, and the the finance officer has always been very very um, uh, has has always been determined that we won't overspend our money or spend the money twice. It's always well been well accounted for, but I see here a movement going on where we're using our reserves to prop up our current account, and that's very dangerous because we're not able to sort of to 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 replace that money, and 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 I see that in 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 this the the, the inability to get a proper business plan that will not show a loss because we've had a huge loss of nearly a million pounds in EEI, which has been, okay, they knew it was going to make a loss, but the fact it made a, it's made a, that loss has happened because the correct budget has not been set for that department. The, the planning fees and building war and income level have dropped completely down, and we've seen that in the building trade anyhow. The planning and regulatory services, and there's a shortfall there in planning fees and building warrant. The roads trading service has, has had a small, a very small surplus, but has not yet, has nowhere near um, received the money which is expected to, to make. But it's not surprising when you see that within that business plan for roads, we have a fixed rate contract with transfers for all the works. And suddenly we get hit by the worst winter for I don't know how many years, and an enormous amount of money has had to be spent on our roads and on transfer roads, for which we have a fixed rate contract. I mean, this, doesn't this stand out to us that we should not have a fixed rate contract there? We have seen, it, it should be in the business plan, that it's, it has a flexibility in the event of having a very bad winter. And this doesn't include the money that was given by the Scottish Government to help us repair our roads. And the building, the building maintenance trading service, another loss. Well, what, should we be continuing with this building maintenance trading service? Most people, when their businesses make losses like this, close the business down. We seem to plough on, still making a loss. And I don't see any, anywhere, anywhere where we're going to get this money from other than from the barrel, which is rapidly emptying where our reserves are. And it gets very dangerously close to start using things like pension funds, which is hugely dangerous in a, in, in a council. So I just think we've got to get a much tighter grip of what, of, of particularly of this EEI, to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in a really dangerous position where we start making losses for which we cannot find any recompense. I think I'd just gently um, outline, or as gently as I'm prepared to be, that we are not dipping into pension funds. These are very highly regulated. There's nothing in these papers that has anything to do with that, whatever. I'd also gently remind, which I think has now been said two or three times, that we exited the contract in question um, as a result of the decisions taken in the budget. Now, quite clearly, it's been demonstrated that was the right thing to do, but 
uh, as you yourself have uh, outlined, if we're not making money at it, we should get out of it. That is, in fact, exactly what we've done. Unfortunately, it, it uh, leaves us with um, a, a debt which is uh, unrecoverable. Uh, but we have already, by dint of the decisions we made in the budget, taken action in that regard. Um, Mr. Garrett will speak for him. Mr. Garrett will speak for himself, I, 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 just very briefly, but um, I don't believe he's become particularly fiscally liberal. He's as cautious uh, with the advice that he provides to all members as he has ever been in the more than a decade I've known him. However, uh, Councillor Dreiber wished to come in and then I'll bring in the leader. Uh, Chair, uh, and again, it's coming back to what's already been done in the E&I Committee where, where we talk about overspend, but under recovery is one of the issues here and the smart targets that were supposed to be smart weren't that smart at all. And we've already put an action plan in place and that's been agreed by E&I to try and get the uh, the recovery or the, the uh, of, of, of planning fees in that to a level where we can achieve those, those particular things. So that action plans are already in place. And again, discussions with, with Paul and, 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 and Alistair are, are ongoing to make sure that the, 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 the whole organization of E&I can come back in as they suggest in, in their budgets. Leader, and then I'll ask Mr. Garrett for some uh, professional advice. Thanks. Um, I think some of the confusion possibly is the, dis the, the description of this as being an overspend, but it's actually an under-recovery of an anticipated income to the tune of nearly £1 million. So, I, however, I would draw attention to the table on page 40, which indicates, yes, that there is an under-recovery of 953000 but due to the diligence of our finance department, there's also funding released, but funding that had been set aside for budget pressures, over a £1 million on that, £1.25 million has been released. We've also got um, again, diligent staff who have uh, managed to collect 655,000 more in council tax and other local taxation than was expected. We've also, again, due to the advice of our finance department, money was set aside for a pay award, which wasn't required, and that has now been released. And other contingencies have been released. So overall, rather than a million pounds being taken out of reserves, over one million pounds has been transferred into the change fund. One point one million hundred twenty-three thousand pounds has been transferred into the change fund. So actually, I think that is our, our staff are to be congratulated actually on their very prudent approach, which has resulted in uh, a money being able to be transferred into the change fund, which will help to support some of the transformation uh, work that we're doing. Thank you, leader, Mr. Garrett. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I think the leaders made the point regarding how we've addressed the overspending. I think it's important to recognise that members did recognise the risk of this overspending during the course of the year and retained the budget pressures money. So it hasn't come from reserves, it's come from that specific budget pressures allowance. However, I do absolutely share the concern regarding the degree of funding required by EEI, whether it's overspending or under recovery. It's a major issue for the Council. We've had to find almost a million pounds of corporate funding to address that. What we're looking to do at the minute is make sure we don't have these issues occurring in the future. There's two uh, detailed reports that will be presented to next month's EEI committee. The first is a field explanation of the 1718 outturn position and the reasons for that. But the second report, which I think is just as important, is how do we establish the appropriate budget and get EEI back on a firm footing for the new financial year. That will be a very detailed report. If there's implications for this committee from that, that will come back to a subsequent meeting of the PNR uh, for further consideration. But there's those two reports. They'll be led by EEI, but will be closely supported by finance and procurement. So they'll be very robust, and they'll come to the, the next month's meeting of the EEI committee. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Councillor Maitland. Um, thank you, um, <coughs> Chairman. Um, 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 without repeating them, um, I, I do want to add my voice to the concerns um, that members have made uh, with respect to the future of enterprising services. I do think we absolutely have to focus on that, um, given what's happened in the past. Um, can I just say that um, my, my um, concentration was actually on the, the, the agreed savings, the delivery of agreed savings, which unfortunately fell short of what we had all agreed um, in, in the past. And I suppose um, I... Um, I'm really wanting to think how it is that we can be assured that officers will be focused um, in the future. I'm well aware that this is a, a, a retrospective view, but, but bearing in mind that 
No officers have been tasked with carrying out the administration's budget, which I might point out that um, I and my fellow independent and I think Lib Dem uh, supported. Um, I, I'm, I am equally concerned that we actually achieve that, and I want to know how we are going to be absolutely certain that your budget, uh, which we approved and supported, and our savings plan is actually going to be delivered. You make a very fair, uh, you make a very fair point. Um, Mr. Garrett, on that? Gillian, sorry. Thanks. Um, just to confirm, just at 3.17, we have, we have carried out a full assessment of those savings that we view as being the most challenging and most um, delivery uh, across the board for the, the new financial year, including those where there's been a shortfall in 2017-18. So we've identified those. Those will be subject to increased scrutiny and review through regular reporting to the new transformation board, as well as to ourselves, and will come through the service um, monitoring positions that are coming to the service committees as well. I, I think, in short, there is no way that they are going to be lost sight of, uh, given that achieving them is really rather important. It, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, in that case, we'll turn to the recommendations. Are we content to note 2.1? Agree 2.2? Agree 2.3? Agree 2.4? Note 2.5? Note 2.6? Note 2.7 and agree 2.8. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, item 9 is implementation of Financial Code 11 debt write-offs, report by Head of Finance and Procurement. This report is brought forward to provide details of debt written off under delegated procedures over the six-month period to 31st March 2018 for member scrutiny. Details of all write-offs are now reported to this committee for scrutiny twice yearly, rather than the previous approach where details were presented to members annually. The report sets out the conditions um, for a debt to be written off as not recoverable and the efforts which are made to recover debt. Members should note that despite a debt being written off, where circumstances subsequently change, the Council does pursue debts previously written off and the report contains examples where this has been successful. Uh, Lindsay Nairn and Paul Garrett are here to speak to the report. Is there anything you would like to add? Okay, open this to members' questions and comments. Councillor Driver. Thanks very much, Chair. Again, it shows how um, well this, this organisation is actually doing in, in, in recovering, not just, you know, uh, the things here. I can give you an example, if I can. I had an ex-serviceman who had a stroke, had to, had to um, sell his house and move into a... Um, uh, 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 an area of, of extra care uh, through DGHB. Uh, when he sold his house, he would go over the £16,000 limit in which you don't get any. Within two days, he informed the, um, the finance uh, section. Within another day, the letter was out saying, this is your, your, your um, benefits will now stop from such and such a date. Uh, and within sort of three days, the, the direct debits that the individual had actually set up was all in, in place. So I have to congratulate the, the, you know, the, 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 the service actually coming forward with this, uh, understanding that there will be debt write-offs every year, um, especially when people unfortunately ha 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 die and things like that. Um, but I think it shows a, a good process in which we actually recover some of our, our benefits. Okay, thank you, Councillor Drybra. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I know, I know, it's in the past because it comes from 2014-15. It's just, I was curious if there was a bit more detail as to why we had so many unpaid invoices with the transfer thing. Um, it's, it, it's just such a big number, and we, we keep talking about lessons being learned, you know. And I kind of like a wee bit of assurance that I know we're not doing the contract anymore, but this, a similar situation could arise in another contract, and it. It would be quite good just to get a wee bit of background and be assured that lessons have duly been learned. Okay, Mr Garrett. Yes, uh, as part of that uh, explanation of the 1718 outcome position, we intend on bringing details of this particular issue into that report to the EI committee next month. In terms of what it relates to, it's basically a, a dispute between ourselves and, and Scotland Transserve, also relates to a dispute that Transserve had with the Scottish Government. 
It's around about the kind of change in contract for trunk road maintenance between Amy and when Scotland Transfer took that over. Uh, it really relates to those works that we were able to charge for and the rates that were applied to those works. And that's been subject to a fair bit of, of dispute. What we're now aware of is that we will not recover that based on the original invoice. And that's why it's been written off and that's what's been reflected in this paper. That's not the end of the issue. EI are still looking at what can be recovered and those monies will benefit the council as and when they're received. So really what we're saying is the original invoice was not recoverable in its form based on the rates reflected in it. However, we are still, and therefore we've written that off. However, we're still looking to recover amounts and that'll be subject to ongoing review with the and I. Is that helpful? Well, it, it does help up to the point of what were the lessons and have we learned them? <laughs> Mr Garrett. Yes, certainly, obviously we'll look with that service, but also as you mentioned earlier on, the contract management uh, strategy is coming up later on this agenda. Those are the kind of issues we look to ensure we're covered as part of that, so we'll look to learn those lessons and ensure that our, our approaches going forward take those into account. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Councillor Mayland. Can I just check? I mean, you know, I, I think we're all sort of anxious and annoyed about this £538,000, um, and it's a question of whether it's an accounting requirement to write it off. Is it technically, do we have to do it? Because, I mean, psychologically, you know, it, it's kind of hanging around there, and if we're still trying to pursue or, or deal with it or try and recover something, can I, can I have some sort of <laughs> um, explanation of this? Because... Um, I, I, I'm, I'm mystified as to why we accept that it kind of disappears if we are still pursuing something. Do you see what I mean? I mean, I, psychologically, I think it's really rather strange to write something off and then still run after it. Mr Garrett? It absolutely is an accounting requirement to, to write it off. We should not reflect income in the council's accounts that we do not anticipate recovering, and that's why we've, uh, we've written it off as having a report. But that does not mean that we're not continuing to seek to recover, if not that amount, a lower amount going forward, and that should not undermine those, those approaches at all. Which would, would also be in line with the reports, or the, the references in the report to write-ons. Um, any other member? Councillor Nicholl? Yeah, on the back of that, if we do recover some money from them, say we get quarter million, where does it go? Because we've written that off. Do we have a big party or, you know, can we you know, hand out or something like that? Because it, it's going to be surplus money. We're not going to know what to do with it. You know, it's, it's a thing, it's a position, it's a position that council's not often in. Let me assure you, there'll be, there'll be, no, um, there'll be no big uh, parties in this committee, that's for sure. Um, where does it go, Mr. The, the appropriate approach would be to credit it to the, the relevant service because they have been hit by the non-recovery to date. However, if that resulted in a surplus, for that service overall, that would be something to be considered by this committee in terms of what to do with those monies that are available. But initially, it would be credited to the relevant service. Okay, so it might in fact come back to us, but there's still no party. If there are no other questions or comments, we'll go to the recommendations. 2.1, we're asked to note and scrutinise um, the uh, write-off of the following accounts. Um, so 2.11, are we content to note? 2.12, and 2.1.3. Thank you. Item 10 is the Corporate Services Revenue Budget Outturn 2017-18, report by Director of Corporate Services. This report provides members with the final outturn information in relation to the Corporate Services Budget for 2017-18. Corporate Services Outturn for the financial year uh, shows an underspend of 79,000. Appendix 1 to this report provides a detailed analysis of the budget outturn position. This reflects a positive result for the service given the continuing financial pressures facing the service and reflects an improved position to that previously reported to this committee. Um, Lorna, are you taking us to this report? Okay, anything that you wish to add? No, Chair. Members, any questions or comments? Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Chair. I've just got a question. On page 48 in Appendix 1, there's a transfer in of money to individual electoral registration under the service reserves, but there doesn't seem to be any money being spent on that. I just wonder if we could get an explanation as to um, sort of that process. It's my understanding, although that it could be completely wrong, that um, a lot of the changes in electoral registration have, have sort of finished or are coming to an end. OK, 
Okay, Lorna. The uh, money comes from the Cabinet Office and the time period for Im implementation of IER is actually up to 2020. And each year we've got the opportunity to bid for extra resources that are available through the Cabinet Office to help us um, progress that work. We've got a number of uh, staff, Canvas staff, who are funded from this um, and also the ICT developments that we have to make to adjust for IER um, have to be funded from that as well. We have also just conducted a pilot for the Cabinet Office with a number of other authorities on streamlining individual electoral registration. And so this will continue over that period. We expect to have used the money by the end of 2020, 20, and that money will come to an end. And we need to be in a sustainable position by that point under the rules. Okay, any other questions or comments? In which case, I'll turn to the recommendations. <laughs> oh, I do beg your pardon. It was just really a, an observation which ties into something Councillor Sarti said earlier that um, you know, the corporate and democratic core was overspent by 5,000 and that is predominantly members' travel expenses. So I think it does make it uh, the importance of the point that Councillor Sarti raised earlier that we should be using, we now have te technology which enables members not to have to drive around quite as much uh, and we should be making best use of that to try and keep those, those expenses down. Look forward to chairing this committee from my sofa at some point in the near future. <laughs> now, perhaps it uh, presents an image that members would not wish to be exposed to. Um, let's move to the recommendations. Are we content to note 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3 and agree 2.4? Thank you. Item 11 is the Director's End of Year Assessment of the Corporate Services Business Plan Performance 2017-18. This report provides members with the director's assessment of the end of year progress for 2017-18 on the delivery of the 2016-18 business plan for Corporate Services Directorate. The Corporate Services Business Plan 2016-18 contains a total of 39 key performance indicators and 16 improvement projects. 19 of the KPIs relate to the activity and use of resources within the Corporate Services Directorate. The remaining 20 indicators relate to council-wide performance. The report provides an overview of the end-of-year performance and Appendix 1 summarises performance against the objectives set out in the business plan. Exception reports at Appendix 2 provide further detail where targets have not been met and set out the action being taken to bring performance back on track. Um, Lorna, is there anything you wish to add to the report? Uh, no chair, I'm happy to take any questions and colleagues are also here. Um, on points of detail. Thank you very much. Councillor McClellan. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm looking at page 79, halfway down the page, the red dot against code DG11, the percentage of staff who have completed an annual performance development review, value of 72% with a target of 95. And if we look at the exception report on page... 100. That gives a little bit more clarity into the directorate and we see in SIPL that 3 out of 10 employees and in EEI almost 4 out of 10 employees are not receiving a performance development review. I was just wondering if there would be an explanation as to why these figures are so low. I, I see a PDR as a very important tool in the development of staff. I see it as very motivating if used right and if used wrongly can be incredibly demotivating. Okay. Through you, Chair, yeah, happy to, to come back in that. There's uh, obviously the exception reports there that, that details that you, that you mentioned. There's uh, a few things that have already been put in place. Uh, to, to, because you're absolutely right, this is an important measure within, within the organisation and is about keeping our staff engaged and motivated as we move forward. There's a management development programme that uh, has, has already started and that's looking at uh, supervisory and, and sort of junior manager level uh, within the organisation and that's going to fundamentally look at you know, the whole engagement, uh, motivation, performance, everything that's associated with that uh, for, for our staff. There's also an effective manager guidance that's been put together and that's coming out. And again, that's, you know, that's picking up about, you know, the important issues within the organisation about our people and, and what we need to do to, 
you know, to keep our, our people and our staff uh, motivated and uh, engaged within the organisation. I've got a wee bit of an update here as well that I'm, I'm happy to share. You know, obviously, these figures were up to 31st of June, uh, 31st of March, sorry. I've got a June, June update, uh, and overall for the council, it has increased to 77%, which, again, I know is below a low, below target, but you can see there is a, a gradual improvement there as we're, as we're moving forward uh, over the last three months. Thank you, Councillor McLean. Do you want to come back? Yeah, I've, I would still like to ask the question of why. Why are the numbers so low? I don't think I've got an explanation there as to why the numbers are actually so low. Okay, Ms. Medell. Again, uh, through, through yourself, Chair, I think uh, they are low, absolutely, and I think it's, uh, it's priorities, I think, uh, that, that we're that staff are, are dealing with at this moment in time. Uh, and I think that's where the training comes in, you know, making sure that this is seen as a priority, that it's all linked, that uh, without having that regular contact with staff, make sure that we're, we're engaging with staff, make sure that, uh, you know, staff are, are on board with where, the, where we're going in the direction we're trying to, to take in our, as an organisation. So I think it's about making sure that is a priority for our our supervisors, managers, as we go forward, because it's obviously not been because 62% and 70% is, is not targeting, is low. Okay. If it's on the same point, Councillor Murray. Um, just heard that explanation, but for a number of years, we've actually seen this is always coming up. This this is one of the, the issues with regards to our staff and I know there's been a lot of transition and changes and people moving about, but it's quite important as well to give staff some sort of confidence and also to identify any training requirements that are required. Is there not an opportunity, though, when you look at the breakdown, is there not an opportunity to learn from um, communities that have got nearly 97%? So surely we should be looking at best practice that's been adopted there and trying to implement that in some of the other um, service departments that Henry has... As outlined. Okay, Paul? Chair, we're very much, the, the councillor is absolutely correct, uh, very much we should all be able to achieve the same outcomes. We're all working by the same scheme that the members agreed a few years ago. Um, we've actually placed an increased emphasis on this um, and we continue to do that. We certainly see it as a priority, as you can tell from the corporate services, 94%. Uh, communities, 96%. There should be no reason why other services should not, should not be able to achieve that. We'll bring Lorna in now. I, mean, I think members are absolutely um, clear and have been clear in the past about the need to make progress in this. And I think while transition and change and different things have been happening, they've been happening in communities is a good example of that. There's been change there and they've still been able to prioritise time to take to talk to their staff in a, in, a, in a formal setting about their performance and how they're performing at work. Um, there's no excuses for it and I think the importance of, that staff place on it has been fed back in the staff surveys. They value it, the staff that get it place high importance on it and I think it's incumbent on those managers and frontline staff who um, aren't getting PDRs or not performing PDRs with their staff at the moment to create the time for that. Um, what I have asked uh, Paul and his team to do is ensure that the reports on performance for other committees are fulsome in relation to the issues within their service and their directorate and how they are performing. So there'll be more information for those committees to scrutinise in terms of their performance to understand that and to provide support and encouragement through the members to make sure that this happens and there's good progress made in those directorates. I certainly welcome that. I mean, this this is important and, um, you know, I, I think the message has to be very clear that we wish to see um, a parity of performance across the council um, and that shouldn't be pegged at 70%. It should be a parity of performance that's, uh, you know, up with the uh, directorates that are currently um, achieving the targets. Uh, Councillor Surtees, you were next. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it, it's difficult to look at the PDR um, situation in isolation, 
And for me, what would be really useful is if we had statistics about supervision. You know, the PDR is not conducted in isolation. It should be a, a year's program of, of development and support of the staff. So that would be very helpful for me um, and for us, I think, to to gauge the effectiveness of, of supervision and support across across the board. Lorna? Certainly happy to provide that and work with other colleagues to, to set that out for members. If it's helpful in terms of corporate services, um, we have a one-to-one -one performance and, and meeting programme for all staff on a on a monthly basis, so that's from myself all the way down through through the channels. So that is at points informal at front line, but for, for others it's very formalised and recorded. Um, and so I, I do know that, that that approach is adopted in some parts of the council as well, and certainly at senior officer level. But if it's helpful, then we'll set that out as part of those uh, reports to provide information in each service, in each directorate. Thank you, Councillor Driver. Yeah, Chair, it's uh, one of these things when I'm going to come back on the side of the managers here. It's, it's easy when you're sitting in offices to do a PDR, but when you're out in the road filling potholes and all that sort of stuff and getting change, changed to other places and you can't get the staff in to do the PDR is, is, is the issue um, because they're doing other work that some, somebody else has made a priority over it. There are some issues, and, and I totally agree with um, Councillor McClellan, that the PDR process is really important in motivating people and that, that side of things, and we, and we actually do need to Im improve that. That, but there's got to be an awareness here that there, there are contrasting priorities on the staff in the front line, depending on their job as well. Uh, so we have to take that into consideration. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the, the points that Lorna made about the, the, sort of the backdrop of what's going on um, uh, in recent years with the efficiency savings and having to sort of reconfigure how we deliver services. But I did note that we um, achieved a, a gold award for health and well-being in terms of how we look after our staff, which I think is, is commendable and noteworthy. Um, I asked a similar question earlier of, of, of Jamie. Um, with this sort of downward trend that we've had in recent years, and reflecting on what Lorna said, is this something that is reflected across other local authorities? How do we compare, um, just to try and benchmark, to see just the situation we're in, how, how good or bad it is? Commissioner Yeah, through you, Chair. It's not something I have to hand, but it's something I can uh, provide provide later uh, and feedback to. Yeah. Yeah, if you could circulate that to members of the committee, I think it might be helpful. Thank you. Councillor Brodie. Thanks, Chair. The theme of my questions on on how we deal with uh, inquiries and complaints from members, community councils and and the public. And page 76, it refers to the, the EMS system. Uh, there, was a, there was a group met in, a group of councillors, working party met in, I think it was September last year, and we had some ideas. But there hasn't been a follow-up follow up meeting to, on that to see how we can improve the efficiency of the EMS so that maybe that's something that could be chased up. Uh, this, the, the Cooney Council Inquiry Service, it's not mentioned here, but it is a source of, source of concern from community councils about how our, our response to that. But in the exception report on, on page 101, is the percentage of stage two complaint responses issued within statutory time scales, and our, our performance is dropping in that. One of the reasons is because uh, more more uh, more complaints are going to the this stage two. So perhaps we need a bit of more analysis on that to to see why 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 these complaints are not being handled at stage one. Is there a change? Is there a change in the way we're dealing with them? Is there less staff to do that? So perhaps a, a, a bit, uh, maybe a future report on that. Maybe the, direct, the head of service can can say something more on that. But more analysis of how we're doing that, and and uh, and perhaps in the the areas where we're areas of complaint which are causing the most most concern amongst the members of the public. Okay, I'll bring Rona in on that. I think naturally we would have to be very careful given we're dealing with complaints. We can't 
risk identifying any complainant, um, however inadvertently. So analysis of the, the nature of the complaint, I think, would have to be handled with caution. But I defer to the experts. Thank you um, for that. Yes, I mean, the, certainly we are seeing complaints that are a lot more complex, and, and members will be aware of some of them because I, I think they jam up your inbox with a lot of copies from time to time as well. So they are getting more complex, they're taking longer to do, and yes, staff uh, are, are certainly, it, it is something that they have to fit in with the rest of their work, so sometimes they can be quite time consuming. As members will read, we are actually going to be reviewing our complaints uh, process. We probably put in a lot of work to processes and procedures at some for some quite simple complaints that could be handled with a phone call and an apology very early on so that we could actually have more time to deal with the ones that are, are more complex. I'm very happy to bring a report that breaks down where the complaints are coming in in, in, in terms of services and, and give some high level uh, view of, of what the nature of those are. Although our, you know, we're not complacent and, and we're not meeting our target, I would like to provide some assurance that in comparison with other authorities, we are doing uh, pretty well in the times that we take to, to handle complaints. And certainly we've had no concerns uh, from the SPSO that they'll be taking any uh, action against us or putting us under any special measures whatsoever. So. We will try hard to, to up uh, the, the performance, certainly within the resources available, but I think that comes from us actually looking at how we run our complaint system, and as I've said many times at other committees, to get a focus on actually solving the problem uh, early on, rather than having a process and a procedure that we follow. Thank you for that reassurance, Rona. Uh, Councillor Brody, yeah, I think that, that's helpful if we can get a report back on that more detailed one. Uh, the the EMS inquiries working group. I just we know anything about that. Yeah. Lorna. I understand that um, there is a working group led through communities. So I'll speak to Derek and make sure there's an update provided to to all members on the progress in that. Thank you for that, Lorna. Uh, Councillor Carruthers. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'll just touch on a couple of small points. I think the first one, which I was wanting to touch on, was it's unusual when we're out performing a target that we get a red uh, a, a red warning. So speaking on page 98, that seems to be the case. There's an explanation there, and it's regards to it looks, on the face of it, I thought, look, look, we're getting warned that we're spending money that we haven't got. That's what it kind of looks like. So I wonder if, or haven't agreed, certainly. I wonder if that's the case. And I just wonder what effect, uh, I know it's on page 107, with nearly 44,000 lost working days a year throughout the council. And personal development reviews, I would agree with the comments said by everybody, I think probably apart from maybe Archie, but they're very, very important. It helps personnel understand where they see themselves within the council and how they can possibly go forward in the best positive way. With the amount of cuts we've got coming up, I think it's important that we do get the PDR right, so it's more of a comment, as quickly as we can, just use the communities as a franchise, I suppose, and implement that across the council and, and let's get that rolling. It, and it may well have a positive impact, the amount of lost days, bring it down from 12 average down to near the nine what our target is, but my question specifically on page 98, I think, and as referenced before in the board, but is that about we're spending money we shouldn't be spending, we're getting warned to say, listen, stop spending money that you've no agreed? Mr Garrett, explain acceleration. Yes, uh, it, it's read effectively because it's over 100% in terms of level of spend. However, it's not bad news, it's not poor performance, it's specifically acceleration of agreed spending rather than any overspending. Uh, members in the past have always been very keen to avoid slippage against the capital programme. So as part of ensuring that, we allow services to overcommit against uh, their approved allocation. That's approved by the relevant service committees, and that's why they've exceeded the allocation in 17-18. But it's, it's approved funding they're using. It's just acceleration of that rather than overspending. By all means. Just for the sake of consistency, I think, Paul, that I think in Communities Committee the other week, it was shown that it was a ship I picked up on. It was nearly... 100% overperformance, and it was still as a green. This is different. So I just wonder, that's why I thought, is this, is this a, actually a warning? And I think we've, we've put forward a congratulations to staff for performing at such a level and the, the, the delivery of affordable housing, I think it was, from, from memory. But I think that's shown as a red, and that's what made me ask that question. Mr. Garrett? Yeah, it, just I confirm that it's not a warning, but we'll look at the way the system's set up to try and avoid this kind of thing appearing as a red in the future. Okay. 
thank you for that. Councillor Nicholl. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, on page 74, graduate placement programme, um, we, we have 10 graduate trainees um, and uh, they've all seemed to have last year's batch seem to have got to positive destination, five within the council and five out with the council. Excellent, first class, very, very good for these young people who are just graduated and being able to get some experience before they move on into the, in their lives. Could we do more? Is 10 the maximum we can absorb? Um, and do other departments do it? Or is, is this 10 purely in corporate services? Or is it cross-council? And could we do more? Or not? These are cross-council graduates, and the members um, agreed to fund this, I think, six years ago, and it's been a, a continuing policy development investment. The, we pay the living wage, and the money that's allocated in the budgets each year um, pays for 10. Um, it would be a matter for members to decide whether to increase that or not. And each year, services set out projects and areas that the graduates would be placed into to do their work. And so you, you find that the graduates are spread across the whole council. And indeed, I think about six weeks ago, we had the graduation. There was a number of young people stood up and spoke about the work they'd done, and the difference they'd made in the council. And certainly we'd agree with that. So if members wanted to develop that scheme, I'm sure officers would work with them to um, enhance it and develop it in any way they felt appropriate. Councillor Nigel. Just, just very briefly. So there is capacity within the, the council to absorb quite a few more of these? We're certainly oversubscribed in the number of projects and pieces of work that the council uh, services think that would benefit and give an opportunity to a young person to gain skills and experience. So, so yes, if, if you're asking me if it's double, I would say that would probably be near the limits of that. Um, but certainly um, modest increases could be, could be uh, included um, and, and developed, but obviously that comes at cost. Um, and we're, we're, again, we've just talked about capacity of managers um, to make sure that the young people get the best supervision and management as well. So those are all things we take into account. I hope that is uh, helpful. Yeah, could I just come back very briefly? Have we any idea of the earn or keep, for want of a better description? You know, do, what we get out of that, it, does that... Uh, does that justify having them? So I think there have been some rather good projects from uh, our graduates in, in the past. And indeed, we've got GDPR later on. Um, Paul, you want to just offer some clarification? Certainly, Chair. Um, the um, programme itself is highly beneficial both for the graduate and for the council because we very much look towards a contribution to the council's priorities at the forefront of the development programme. So there's personal... Um, achievements to be made, but we also get a piece of work linked to the Council's priorities in return. Councillor Ferguson, if it was on the same point. Uh, yes, it is actually, and uh, I have to agree that it's an excellent programme. Uh, the level of mentoring is first class as well, and the work produced um, on the whole is of uh, exemplary standard, and I'm actually delighted. I, I just wish we could have kept them all. Um, rather than they're going away to find uh, employment elsewhere. But the personal experience I've had, uh, the uh, graduates' uh, um, placement in Communities Committee has been extremely positive. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. It's actually just about the, uh, the figure for the number of days of absence at 12.03. It's been, it's been hovering around that for for quite a long time, and also if you look at point one point, if you look at one point three two, uh, the Freeston Galloway Council was placed twenty eighth out of thirty two councils. But um, if you then go on to page one one eight, and you actually look at the cost of absence between SIPL and EEI, you're looking at two point six million pounds. That's a sizable amount of money, and in fact, the amount of money. Sickness costs and EEI is enough to wipe out the overspend or under recovery, or however you want to want to say it. And equally, we've got an issue. If you look at page one one six, where thirty nine percent and EEI or of absences are on a Monday and a Friday. Uh, same for corporate services. Same for 
Sipples at 37%. Is there an institutional problem with this aspect of people's performance, their uh, absence? Or is the nine days just an unrealistic target? Um, but if, when you look at the amount of money it costs, it's a, it's a substantial opportunity if we can control this to address some of our other budget initiatives. So my main question is, is nine days realistic? And how quickly do you think we can achieve it? Paul? Chair, I would agree that the, the figures don't look uh, there or palatable. Um, that's one of the reasons from page 107 we've actually set out a supplementary, more detailed report for members about what we're actually doing about it here. Um, the number of, of days has been, uh, in terms of a target, has been nine for a number of years, and we've been gradually working towards that with, with mixed um, outcomes. Um, we have improved on that before. The increase of 0.3 days for local government employees this year is it's probably unfair when we compare that with the amount of work that we've actually done within the Council to improve that. There's been a lot more uh, absence due to flu. There's been lots more absence due to um, critical illness, accidents out with the Council, and a number of other factors that are largely to an extent out with uh, the Council's control. And we would reckon that had we uh, not uh, taking the steps that we have in the current year, the absence could be as much as two days higher because of that. So I know it's gone up 0.3 days, but I think but for the measures that we've actually put in place over the course of the last year, we'd be looking at significantly high levels of absence. Flu was reported nationally in terms of a, a problem across the country, and we would also expect that a lot of councils would be reporting higher levels of absence over, over the last year. Those figures are are not yet available. Um, so that's the reason for actually putting the, the detail behind that to actually let you know that we're on we're on this and uh, but for the measures that we put in place it, it could have been considerably higher. Now the the actual number of days lost and the, the figures in there, it's lost productivity, but actually the only additional cost for, for absence is where we require to backfill. And so the the figure of uh, lost productivity has just had to be covered by those members of staff that are actually within the council when that happens. Okay. Do you wish to come back? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I, um, I realise that. But I mean, it's like uh, Councillor Dreiber was on about when we've been talking about people not getting their, product, uh, their appraisals and things like that. You know, that has an operational effect, this sort of uh, absence and sickness. I uh, think that this. Councillor Driver said things just don't get done. It puts other staff under a lot of pressure, which can then lead to them subsequently being absent. But part of my question was, is nine days a realistic target and is there any likelihood of ever getting there? I think nine days is the target. Uh, it's a realistic target. It's a target that's, that's used quite commonly by local authorities in terms of something to aspire to. The problem with that is we make the target 10 days, we'll probably not better that. So, you know, we're, we're, we've worked on it. We've driven it down from considerably higher. I mean, a few years ago, we were up at 14, 15 days. So we actually have made progress. But I think there's been particular circumstances in the current year that's led to these spikes. And that's why we wanted to give you a bit more of a, an explanation. We're not doing anything different from any other council. The council that leads Scotland, um, we're comparing notes with them and largely what they do is what we do. We just have to work at it. OK, thank you for that. Councillor Driver? Unless Councillor Nicholson wants to come to the same point. If it's on the same point, Councillor Nicholson. Yeah, it's, it's just a case, just following up on that, and the observations from that, and what Paul was saying, you know, there's the operational wise and the, the things we do within the Council are broadly uh, the same as what other councils do, but. Uh, there's a mention in here about East Ayrshire, I think it is, and um, they, we probably carry out the same, and we're having closer links with them to see what they're doing, because their is 8.83 days and ours is 11.73, but we're doing the same things, spend to save and all that, you know, and whatever it might be. But obviously there's a, something that they're doing that we're not, or some practices that we're carrying out. 
Chair, we're not actually aware of anything that they're doing, and, and had, had we realised what they're doing, we'd be following that guidance as well. We're continuing to do, uh, and we've set out a, a series of things that in particular we're going to do with occupational health as a result of a lot of the uh, increase this year being as a result, what we regard as uncontrollable. We're going to try and bring that within our control so that that, that again won't be repeated. And we're always looking back at what we could have done. Um, we're not we're, and, and therefore trailing, uh, tailoring our processes to make sure that we're keeping up with any practice that could encourage better attendance at work, and, and we're working on it harder than ever. Okay, thank you for that. I'll bring Lorna in in terms of reference to the target and the level it's set up. I think members make a valid point about the target that we need to look at the business plan that we bring forward with other uh, parts of the, the council and other directorates around the targets there. Um, and we'll, we'll do some work during the summer and also look um, again at what other councils are doing. I think one of the things to, to pick up is around the benchmarking with other local authorities. This council has a model where all our staff are employed directly with us, where councils have either outsourced private sector, so for instance waste collection is a significant area, where uh, councils have cheaply transferred their staff under health and social care, or indeed operate alleys or arms length organisations. None of the sickness absence stats for those uh, staff are included in the reporting that we compare ourselves with. So I think we really need to get below that to understand how we compare in relative job groups and experience out there to, to make best sense of this. Um, I think the overall target is important, but we need to get to a point where there's a, a, an absolute clarity about the incidents, particularly around staff who've got very physical jobs and, and those areas as well. So we need to do a bit more work around that and bring it back to members as part of the business planning. I think that's a very helpful point in terms of making policy with um, best data. Councillor Driver. Th thanks very much, Chair. I'm actually quite pleased to hear I've, I've learned that Councillor Johnson and Carruthers actually listened to me. <laughs> um, I'm, just, I'm just looking at um, page 105 and it's, it's a question more than it. It's about those targets when you look at policies that are actually coming in, percentage of requests for personal information completed within 40 days. You then look at GDPR that's coming in. Is that going to have a knock-on effect to that particular target or, 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 you know, key performance indicator? There are other policies that are coming in that may have effects on other you know, key performance indicators as well. And I just want to make sure that we're looking at this continually to make sure that we have the, the appropriate measures in place. Okay, Laura. Certainly, we're taking the time after debate today to go and, and look at our draft business plan that we will bring to members in September, uh, Councillor Drybra. On the, on the subject access request, that 40 days is set in legislation. It's not uh, something we've chosen, but we know, like other authorities, it's really, really difficult. And colleagues who are responding to those requests tend to be frontline social work staff and education staff who need to come away from the, the front line to do that work. Um, but we also need to balance hitting a target with making sure we treat people's data very carefully, sensitively, and these tend to be really complex and long-term cases. So like everything in this, I think we need to reflect statutory targets, but maybe look towards what, what best looks in an optimum way for the council as well. So we will take that on board. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor McClellan. Thank you again, Chair. I'll try and keep this brief. I know we're We've been uh, going on for quite a while on this uh, paper. The first point I've got is page 85, and it's the the table, the second table down, the second last item. There's a green target status when the value is 85.71 against the target of 90. I don't think that should be a green tick. I think that's just a, an error. Um, I was just making that as an observation. Now, if we go to page 80, Page 80, the yellow triangle on the percentage of invoice sampled and paid within 30 days. I do note in there that 67% uh, of our invoices that we receive on, on this are paid within 10 days. 
That's absolutely, that, that is excellent. The value that the small to medium enterprises benefit from that is incredible. There's many people out there that are, are on 30 day terms that are paying at 90 days and longer. That's really important and I see that as a real positive, what we're actually doing to help these uh, businesses that we, we deal with. So I actually uh, applaud you for that. Now, I'd also make an observation there. Our neighbouring council, Cumbria County Council, they have a scheme where within seven days they will make a payment, but the contractor and supplier then gets a reduction in their payment of up to 2.5%, and that that um, is something that they actually put in their tendering process. So I just wanted to table that as maybe an opportunity, because if we're getting down to these levels, it's maybe a case that, yeah, we should maybe grab something back. So that's maybe something for the future that we can take forward in the Transformation Board, and I'm just making that as a, an observation. My final point is on the, the health and safety performance, and that's on page 83, and the red dot about the implementation of our accident incident reduction strategy. That programme started in July 2016, and we're only 52% 50 through that on a completion date, um, without even looking, I think it was March, March this year. I'm just wondering, if we look at the exception paper, which is the second last paper in the document, it still doesn't give a completion date, although it's indicating on there that there's expected actions in the year 1819. I still think if we do have an action plan, it's important that we don't allow it to go on ad infinitum and we do get a closure date. That's absolutely critical when you set objectives. Chair, I would confirm that that's the target for, for completion of that. We will be working within that. And, and as soon as we can on that. Okay, thanks for that. Um, any other comments on the other points raised by Councillor McClelland? Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Campbell? Thank you, Chair. It's just to uh, go back, if I may, to um, the issue of benchmarking. It, it, it seems to have come up several times during the, the, the discussion we've had on this paper. And clearly there are um, socio-economic socio factors that are uh, impacting on local authorities. Is it feasible, is it possible to have some sort of comparison built into this report in the future in terms of how other local authorities are performing? Does that data exist? Do other members think that would be something that would help give a bit of perspective on um, you know, just how good or bad the, the situation actually is? Lorna, one for you, I think. Um, yes, and the plan is for the business plans to present that information, both their, both their performance over a period, but the national performance for that exists over a period. Yes, it does exist. It's publicly available for some things, obviously, depending on others, and through some professional groups. So we would anticipate providing that in a full in the report. In the business plan itself, it includes it, but it's not always evident, I think, in the reports and the updates. So certainly we've taken that on board. On that same point? Yeah. I'm just coming back to what, what Lorna said earlier on as well. Of course, different councils work different ways. They've got arms length organisations, they've got you know contractors. We, we don't provide that information. So, therefore, it could be skewed as it's saying, and we have to be aware of that. That's a very valid point. Councillor Nicholl, my apologies. I think you, you had wanted to come in on the points that Councillor McClellan was making. Uh, that is correct, uh, uh, Chair. Thank you very much for letting me in, though. Um, just to say that, country, I, I, I applaud what Councillor McClellan was, was pointing out, that we're paying fairly quickly, etc. I've just had a case, two cases this week where they haven't been being paid um, and that's got sorted out. That's not what my, 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 my comment's about. What my comment is about is that there has been a change in the systems that small contractors have to submit their, 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 their invoices and the, um, the, the contractors have not been informed of these changes. So they've been putting in invoices and they've been being rejected because they weren't in the right format. And, you know, if you're going to change the system, for goodness sake, tell the folk that are going to be sending the bills. You know, it um, makes life simple. Plus, a lot of the smaller businesses who do work for the council, and it's vital work to their, to their businesses, um, are not computer experts. And one of the difficulties is that maybe the boss of the company or maybe somebody like my, myself, it might be difficult to put in an invoice um, in the required format for them to do that timelessly. So just, if I could just raise that with the, the officers, 
that this is important that they inform, when they change the system, they inform them and that take into account that the people are uh, not computer experts. I do take the point. I mean, it had been my understanding that there had been a programme of engagement and, and information um, as regards the change. Well, I'll bring Mr Garrett in. It hadn't reached out for children. No, as you say, we have changed the systems. It's to improve the processes for both the council and for the suppliers. There was a, a programme of communication and engagement. If that's missed someday, we'll certainly look into that and try and address it. But certainly we did try and ensure that all suppliers were contacted so they were very clear on the new arrangements. I'm sure officers will be happy to pick up um, uh, issues where they've arisen. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure they will, and I'll, I'll speak to Paul or, or afterwards, but um, small comfort to the people who are lying out their money. Councillor Carruthers. Thanks, Chairman. Very quick, because it, it, it will be repeating some of what's been said, but on page 114, I think it's been brought up by a couple of members, but benchmarking with other councils, it's absolutely explicit at 1.31. 1.32 uh, in the following page, which Councillor Johnson has already picked up on, I think we, have, we, we really need a paper round about that, because of 28 out of 32, that's going back a couple of years now, or at least a, well over a year ago. That's unacceptable, really. Uh, Paul said, listen, we're not really doing anything different for any other council. I think on the face of it, that's maybe the case, but I think Lorna's come in with arguments and said, well, actually, we may well be, because whether we deliver services through the private sector, through values, through whatever, Health and social care, there's, there's questions around about that. I wonder, Chairman, uh, through yourself, maybe you'd pull it up either 2.3 or through your agenda management meetings, but I think we need to see a full report in regards to how we, we, we actually address this in a more balanced picture so we see it across all local authorities where do we rely in real terms, including the external uh, externalised services. I, I take the point. I think it's important to establish whether it truly is 28 out of 32 or a different position altogether. Um, in making policy on the basis of the best data, I think it's very important. I think it would be captured by 2.3 um, in terms of how we um, take forward the new corporate services business plan. Uh, I suspect that would be the, the best fit for it, um, certainly noting the work that um, uh, Lauren has undertaken um, to, to do in, in preparation for that. Uh, my feeling is that that would fit well um, there, uh, if that's agreeable to members. Are there any other comments or questions? In which case, we'll turn to the recommendations. Um, so at 2.1, we've been asked to uh, review the overall summary at Appendix 1, which we have done. 2.2, uh, um, we've been asked to scrutinise the exception uh, reporting and consider whether the actions proposed are adequate to improve performance and enable future monitoring of areas which have not met the target in Appendix 2 and 3. Um, there's one specific uh, issue, of course, in terms of the comparators with authorities. But I think if we can cover that under 2.4, where we're asked to note any developments uh, or amendments requested as a result of the committee scrutiny will be incorporated into the new Corporate Services 2018-23 business plan, which will be presented here in September. Are we content to note that? Thank you very much. Um, we've got halfway through the agenda. I'm advised that lunch has arrived. It would seem to be perhaps an opportune moment if members are agreeable. We'll reconvene at 1 o'clock. Thank you. Okay, members, that's um, one o'clock, we're just gone. Um, so we shall make a start again. We are for it. Um, item 12 is uh, the contract and supplier management strategy report by Head of Finance and Procurement. This report seeks approval to implement a contract and supplier management strategy, which is provided at Appendix 1. Um, contract and supplier management is a critical factor to ensuring the efficient and effective delivery of the Council's contracts for goods, services and works. The overall aim of the contract and supplier management strategy presented at Appendix 1 is to ensure delivery of the objectives within the Council's procurement strategy and to provide a framework which provides consistency in approach by appropriately trained officers who are managing the Council's suppliers in order to minimise the total cost of ownership and maximise efficiencies during the life of contracts. Um, so, Paul and Karen are here to speak to the report. Is there anything that you would like to add? Okay, members, with that, we'll go straight to questions and comments. Councillor Driver. So thanks very much. Here. Obviously, this is, this is important to our uh, supply chain as well, as well as our SMEs and that. And I think Karen and our team have done a lot of work on this, working with Enterprise and D&G as well. Uh, it really is a, a proportionate move to, to bring this into line with the procurement way of doing things. 
Uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with this this, this um, uh, report here, uh, and I would I would recommend it to the, the members here. Um, yes, I, I I agree um, with Councillor Dreiber. Um Could could I have some um, discussion and, and some uh, response to how open this is as a process? Um, for example, on I think page one five eight. One five eight. No, sorry, one five six. Um, <clears throat> well, we're talking about um, Appendix 1, Contract and Supplier Management Prioritisation and Process Flow Chart. And at the bottom, um, you talk about the balanced scorecard, share and publish results. Um, does this mean that any information that is held by the Council um, about uh, the way that the contract is being delivered and, and implemented is then, then shared with the supplier, always. Can I be sure that that's the case? Karen? Yeah, all the information would always be shared with the, the supplier, irrespective of if there's the, the need for a review meeting. The completion of the scorecard and support and comments will always be shared with, with the supplier. Where we're referring to publication, that would allow us to, um, where we're using the Scottish Government's tender portal, um, to support the management of a contract, then the publication as well would actually appear there, which would allow the council to benchmark against performance of that particular provider um, or supplier where, we're, where there's another public sector organisation using the same supplier. We're able to compare information. I don't think that will be happening in the immediate future, but um, that's a longer term aspiration to allow us to benchmark with other authorities as well. Councillor Midland, do you wish to come back? Okay, uh, members, are there any other questions or comments on this item? Councillor Nicholl. Just a comment um, on page 125, 3.2. Implement appropriate governance arrangements to effectively administer our contracts. And I've written in the margin DG1. Um, presume we're taking appropriate steps not to repeat that, that scenario, if, if that's... Case. Lorna, if you take that one, please. Sorry, can you repeat? Sorry, I didn't catch the last part of that, Councillor Nicholl. Implement appropriate governance arrangements to effectively administer our contracts. And I've written in the margin DG1. I'm just hoping that we've learned something and that we're not going down the same route. We will not go down the same route in the future. Certainly, this strategy, along with the procurement standing orders, are, are one element, not all, but one element of ensuring that we've got uh, all the things in place to make sure that we effectively manage and procure and deliver and continue to monitor contracts that we enter into, including, including building contracts for building projects as well. Of course, members will recall that um, this, the specific uh, consideration and response to Professor Cole's recommendations will be a matter for full council. Um, so I would expect a detailed consideration and scrutiny of uh, the proposals coming forward when we get those there. Members, if there are no other questions or comments on this, are we content to approve the strategy as set out at Appendix 1? Thank you very much. Thank you both. Okay, item 13, um, Civic Government, Scotland Act 1982, sections 17 and 18A, Taxi Licensing Review of Maximum Fair Structure, report by Head of Dem Legal and Democratic Services. This report relates to the Council's duty to review its maximum fair structure for taxis, sets out the statutory procedure and relevant considerations uh, when determining a proposal for review. The fair structure was last reviewed in 2016, when the committee resolved to make no changes at that time. Uh, Sharon Hines is here to speak to the report. Is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, no, nothing further to add. Just happy to take any questions. Okay, members, questions or comments? Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Chair. I think the, the report's pretty self-explanatory. I think um, I would propose that um, look at append the appendix, um, the sort of six questions there about the, the sort of changes uh, to be made or not to be made. Um, number six is pre-booked tyres on another page where there's no option to change it. Um, I would propose that on one, two and three, which is mileage on social hours and Christmas and New Year holidays, um, they remain unchanged. 
on number four, which is waiting time, that the charge of 35 pence is increased to 40 pence. And for number five, which is soiling of vehicles, that the charge of up to 50 pounds is changed to up to 100 pounds. Thank you for that proposal, Councillor Wilson. I'll just emphasise that clearly these are the maximum levels which we are setting. But certainly I'm quite happy to second that proposal if necessary. Members, uh, have we any other questions or comments on that item? Councillor Campbell. Uh, it's, it's just a, an observation, perhaps a, a suggestion, um, when uh, this comes back to committee in a year and a half's time. It's just, I, I would have found it helpful to be able to review the the fees in the last, you know, the last um, period and the period before that, just to see the impact it has on um, people's ability to afford to pay taxes and indeed for operators to operate effectively and, and um, maintain a, a, a cost of living. So is that possible? Is that something that could be done without too much difficulty for future reports? Sure. Yeah, we can certainly give you the details of the, the last reviews, no problem. The I think the issue is probably because they're a maximum fee, it's difficult to judge each operator. I'll, I'll charge different different fees um, depending on uh, various various other um, issues that arise. So it's, it's kind of difficult to, to judge at, at that point, but we could certainly provide you with the previous reviews, no problem, yeah. Just to come back, I, I don't want it to be something that's onerous. It's just so that it's a quick reference to see what, where, where we were previously uh, and, and compare that to what's been recommended. Thank you for that. Councillor Carruthers? <clears throat> I suppose I can hear where Councillor Wilson's coming from in regards to it. It's only when I'm picking up on his point five, I think, soiling of vehicles. Most people relate to that. Somebody probably vomiting in the back in the early hours of Friday or Saturday morning. But if somebody's got a medical condition and they've got protective clothing on that leaks or sore and whether it could be incontinence, whatever, that's still soiling. So we're doubling the charge. So I think we'll have to be considerate in regards to that particular Circumstances. Somebody's got a medical condition, fair enough, if they've abused us all through alcohol or whatever type of misuse of drugs and alcohol, that's different. But when it comes to this vulnerable, it's a vulnerable person with medical, medical conditions, sorry, I think we should be considerate of that potential. I, I, I would rather hope that operators might be a, a little bit cautious about implementing the, the soiling charge under those sort of circumstances, irrespective of um, the, the level at which it's set. Um, I do recognise what uh, uh, Councillor Carruthers is saying. Councillor Wilson, you wanted to come back in and then I'll bring Ron in. These words don't often pass my lips, but I agree with Councillor Carruthers. Um, I think what's important to note here is, is that that policy will be determined by individual taxi you know, drivers, and I would imagine that whatever policy they have for, you know, on a Friday night, I'm sure we um, don't sympathise with people paying £100 for, um, for, for spewing at the back of a, a taxi. Um, I certainly would hope that tax operators wouldn't occur, you know, incur the same charge for somebody uh, with a medical condition. But I think that essentially, no matter what decision we take here today, the policies of, of those individual tax operators will continue regardless of the, of the cost. And I would certainly hope that uh, that isn't penalising those with medical conditions. Rona, I'd just like to bring you in for his advice here. I mean, is there any guidance that we can issue in terms of when it's appropriate to levy that sort of charge? Yeah, I think that's something that we could do in this case is to put out an advisory note as to what our expectation is, you know, that it's not for someone with a medical condition or even someone taking their ill child to the doctors or whatever, you know, these things can happen. So, But I think the the gist of the consultation was very much about uh, exactly as members have thought what happens on a Friday, Saturday night in the late hours. I, I think that would certainly be welcome because I do recognise that, that we wouldn't wish there to be unintended consequences for sure. Councillor Marshall, you wish to come in next. Glad for that suggestion, but uh, also I think the, when we actually, the motion there is about actually up to £100, so it'd be at discretion of the taxi operator. Councillor Campbell, do you wish to come back? Just a, a, a quick point. In, in terms of our statutory obligation, we set the maximum rates. I, I'm, am I right in assuming that it's the taxi driver to you know, pursue um, a, a charge, um, possibly through the small claims court, but it's not a council responsibility? It's not placing any burden on us? Sharon, just for clarification at that point? Yep, certainly, yes. It's, it's completely down to them. We wouldn't necessarily get involved unless it's in a specific breach of the condition, but if, it, if it's the a matter between themselves, they would take that up themselves, yep. 
Okay, appreciate the clarification. Members, if there are no other questions or comments on this, we'll turn to the recommendations and we'll just go through them a, a little carefully. At, at 2.1, we're asked to consider and agree whether we wish to make amendments to the existing maximum uh, fare structure. Uh, so we have a proposal that we would wish to make an amendment. If there's no counter proposal to that, can we then consider 2.2? Um, and I'll just seek clarification just for members' information on, the, on what the, uh, the amendments are. Perhaps Councillor Wilson, you could run through them again. So just... <coughs> apologies, I'm reading off the appendix on page 169. Um, number one, where it says mileage, and the question is, do members wish to amend the maximum mileage charge? Um, that is no. Number two, which is on social hours. Do members wish to amend on social hours charge? The answer is no. Uh, point three, where it's Christmas and New Year holidays. Do members wish to change the arrangements? The answer is no. Uh, on number four, on waiting time, do members wish to amend the waiting time charge? Um, yes, and the price being 40 pence. And on point five, which is soiling of vehicles, do members wish to amend this charge? Yes, and set it at up to £100. Okay, to check that members are clear that they understand that and are content with it. Councillor Carruthers? I am content with the fact, but I think we got, we got advised there that, that we'd probably get some kind of advice note in regards to uh, any, any licence holder and how we'd expect that guidance to be interpreted and hopefully they would apply it that way. Okay, can we reflect that uh, in the recommendations, actually? Uh, Councillor Juicy. Chair, I just thought when I was reading this, the um, unsociable hours is midnight to 7 o'clock in the morning. I appreciate that there's a lot of people probably get a taxi maybe to start work at 7 o'clock in the morning. I know that many council services start work at 7 o'clock in the morning. Is that considered an unsociable hour? Would it be fair to bring that back to 6 a.m. in the morning? So you've got that six level. So that we're not penalising people who are travelling for work reasons, etc. Ron? I think it's just to bear in mind that you know these are for taxis. Most people that would perhaps have a standing arrangement for work would have that with a private hire company where they would maybe negotiate and set the fee themselves. So that this is this is taxi fares. Councillor Wilson, if it helps Councillor Giusti from experience, some taxi drivers and taxi operators actually op start the end on social hours element of pricing at six a.m. rather than seven a.m. Okay, so if we're content with the uh, proposed amendments, um, okay, we have a suggestion then that we could um, amend on social hours to mid to between midnight and six a.m. Would members be content with that? Absolutely, double check. Okay. In that case, can we agree to adopt the new maximum fare structure? as amended, noting that we'll have um, guidance in terms of the use of um, uh, the soil charge. Can we then go to 2.3 and agree that the new maximum fare structure will take effect from 1st September 2018, subject to no representations being received following the publication of the structure, as detailed in paragraph 313. Are we content with that? It's agreed. Thank you. Uh, item 14 is a Civic Government Scotland Act 1982, Schedule 1, Paragraph 16A, Electronic Communications, report by Head of Legal and Democratic Services. This report seeks the agreement of members for the introduction of a policy to enable the licensing authority to accept applications for the grant uh, or renewal of a license, objections or representations and notifications of a change to a license, and also provide notices by electronic means, namely email. Um, Sharon is still with us to speak to the report. Is there anything that you would like to add to that? Uh, no, nothing, nothing further at all. I'm just happy to take questions again. Okay, members, any questions or comments? Councillor Driver. Thanks very much. Here again, this, this is sort of tidying up more than anything else and, and making sure that people can have the opportunity through electronic means to, to, to get in touch with the, the licensing authority. Uh, I don't see any problem with this and we'll go with the recommendations. Very happy to go with that. Are members content? They are. Thank you very much, Sharon. 
Okay, item 15 is the Dumfries and Galloway Draft Annual Governance Statement 2017-18, report by Director of Corporate Services. This report presents this year's Draft Annual Government Statement 2017-18 for member review and approval. As part of the annual accounts, the Council produces an annual governance statement which explains how the Council has complied with the terms of the Code of Corporate Governance for the year ended 31st March 2018 and in accordance with the SIPFA Code of Practice in Local Authority Accounting in the UK. SIPFA guidance advises that the annual governance statement should be an open and honest self-assessment of the organisation's performance across all of its activities, with a clear statement of the actions being taken or required to address areas of concern. Um, Rona will speak to the report. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, there's, there's one thing I'd like to add is that our new uh, local code of corporate governance will be coming, uh, not to full council, but to this committee in September. That's it's something that's delegated to this committee, so that will come here first in September. Okay, thank you, Rona. Any questions or comments from members? In that case, I'll move swiftly to the recommendations. Um, at uh, <laughs> two point one, we're asked to review. I take it we've already done that. If there are no questions or comments, two point two asked to delegate to the head of legal and democratic services to arrange the necessary revisions to the draft annual governance statement following this committee. Don't believe there are any. And at 2.3, we're content to note that the annual government statement will form part of the unaudited financial accounts presented to full council on the 26th of June. And I am reminded that this will be um, an item of business for Audit and Risk Committee uh, next week. Are we content with that? I think we are. Thank you very much. Item 16 is the Corporate uh, Anti-Fraud and Anti-Corruption Policy Statement and Strategy um, report by Head of Legal and Democratic Services. I assume Kevin Gerrithy is running here now, <laughs> so I might speak slightly more slowly, but not much. This report presents for member approval a formal policy statement and strategy demonstrating the Council's commitment to combating fraud and related behaviours in its business affairs. Council works closely with the Scottish and UK governments in combating fraud and corruption, as well as with a wide range of other agencies, including Police Scotland, Audit Scotland, other local authorities, the NHS, etc. Kevin Garrity is not yet here to speak to the report. Um, so we'll, we'll handle it from the top table. Um, is there anything that either of you would like to add? I think just to say to members, this is a good practice that we are implementing and, and it's very much an approach that, and I've used this with uh, members before around what we do around resilience and um, dealing with uh, community safety. This is really about being proactive about these things, working with Police Scotland and others to make sure that we have the best processes in place and that we learn and uh, continue to develop those processes um, and reflect in good practice and taking advice from those with the uh, um, experience in these areas. Yeah, thank you very much, Lorna. Um, members, any comments or questions? Strikes me as a, a very sensible thing to uh, be undertaking. Councillor Carruthers? Just a very brief one. It's something we spoke about in Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee as well. And I just uh, One of the things we're looking at is getting this Ricky Hutton, I think, coming down to do a seminar. I just wonder if it might be something that this committee might be uh, aware of or even interested in, but I've, he came down previously. Through the Audit and Risk uh, Management Committee, it was very, very interesting. As one of the few councils that turned up to that, very, very interesting. He's the head of fraud, I think, for Scotland when it comes to investigations. So, based in Edinburgh, uh, really interesting. I just when I seen this, it just brought it to mind. I thought it might be something this committee is interested. It might not, but certainly Audit Risk and Scrutiny are very interested in having a seminar with uh, Ricky Hutton. Thank you for um, highlighting that. One. Um, um, I met with um, Ricky actually about three, four weeks ago just to finalise this document with Kevin and he's more than um, able and willing to come and both present to members of committee or run seminar or indeed have an informal discussion. So he's, he's very open to that uh, um, if members wish. I think that sounds like a good idea. If that's being organised through the Audit and Risk Committee, perhaps it could be open to all members. Thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, so, members, we're asked to approve the anti-fraud and anti-corruption policy statement and strategy as at Appendix 1. Are we content to approve? I think we are. Thank you. Item 17 is the Risk Management Framework, report by Head of Legal and Democratic Services. This report seeks, 
This report updates members on proposed amendments to the risk management framework, um, which strengthen the existing risk management arrangements and uh, increase awareness of effective risk management across the Council. Um, as part of a cycle of review and improvement, um, a review has been carried out on the risk management framework in order to reflect changes within the Council and updates required to improve its operation. Um, the risk management framework has been strengthened to reflect uh, the need for a strong link with business planning and to provide for regular reporting within the business planning cycle. Risk management is not carried out in isolation and is a fundamental part of how directorates plan their services to ensure delivery of the priorities and commitments set out in our council plan. Uh, this approach has been founded uh, on best practice and aligns with the best value toolkit on risk management produced by Audit Scotland. Uh, if approved, the new risk management framework um, will be discussed at uh, Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee at the September meeting, I understand, uh, in terms of the report uh, of the role that that committee um, has under the framework. Um, and it will be for Audit Risk and Scrutiny to be assured that effective risk management is taking place in accordance with this framework. Um, so, is there anything that you'd like to add to the paper? No, nothing more to add. Happy to take any questions. Okay, members, questions or comments? Councillor McClelland. Thank you very much, Chair. Again, this is a, a document and strategy that I've came across uh, on numerous occasions in my past historical work. Uh, what I would just like to ask the question, uh, audit and scrutiny accepted, how this framework, how will this inform the papers that we receive regularly through our committees? <coughs> Okay, Rona, one for you. No, the, the, the plan is that managers uh, will now uh, make much more of an effort, I think, to take <coughs> this into account in all their work, and we're certainly going to see it in the, become a feature of our business plan as well this year, that you will get re regular reporting on risk uh, and all, all that we've identified in our business plan, so that will come to you in the same way as our performance information does, so that you can see that managers are actively managing the risk that they've identified for their service for the year. Okay, uh, Councillor McClellan, do you want to come back? Where I was coming from there, obviously there's a massive exercise that we're undertaking through the Transformation Board, and I would see this as a key element within that, within the hard decisions and key decisions that we're going to be taking going forward. So it's, it's crucial that visibility of this is seen by all. It's a very important point. Um, members, any other questions or comments? Councillor Carruthers? Oh no, I beg your pardon, you were... Uh, I was walking in, but plus, but Elaine was obviously waving before me. Uh, okay, yeah. Elaine first, and then you. Just really, first of all, just to observe, uh, uh, observe that this was one of the re recommendations of Professor Cole's report, so this is actually fulfilling, although it obviously predated that, it, is, it was one of the, the recommendations. And it may be rather a trivial point, but on page 226, certainly in the copy I've got, there would appear to be something missing. There's a a section in the middle with a mic of rather nice pretty colours on it, but there's no narrative or anything of that nature. Ah, that's missing actually on, on the ones that have been circulated, I think. Okay, we can arrange to circulate that to members. Okay, um, Councillor Carruthers. Just very briefly, because I'll probably scrutinise this more than the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee, but in regards to, can I pick up on Councillor McClellan's point first? Uh, and just put a case scenario and see how it would apply personally. So locally, uh, with myself at the moment, I'll two two cases where there's the road between, I'll have to be parochial here just to put this in, into consideration, but I'm trying to be strategic in regards to th this here. But So the road between uh, Brykirk and Eaglesfield is horrendous and that comes into both Andale East and Estale and Andale South Ward. Uh, so there's risks there, what I would perceive as being, so we're looking at the roads officials managing this risk, and coming back and being reported to us uh, in regards to health and safety and what risk reputational damage so on and so forth to the council. So as I say, the cars and vehicles uh, actually hitting each other head on because they're avoiding potholes at speed sometimes, and they really do. There's some parts you can't actually avoid the potholes. So there's real risk there, I think, health and safety. And there's visibility displays there where the grass, because of a procurement process being delayed slightly, the grass has, has cut and has been delayed by about three or four weeks. And it's just standard. If it was a, it'd be a breach of planning condition if it went above 1050 millimetres, just over a metre. Some of it's said about 1.2 metres now. And there's two crossroads near me again, which has been fatalities there in the past when it was clear. And I had to edge it to, so that my car was, the, the front of the car was actually in the white line before I could get across, before I actually got the visibility to make a safe, uh, safe passing. 
So I just wondered, how does it feed out so back, picking up on what Councillor McClellan said? And the only other point was very minor in regards to last time this, it may have been a procedural change, but it went to Audit and Risk Management Committee first in November 12, I see, right before it came here. It's the reverse way around now, just a wee bit of clarification on that. Has there been a procedural change that I've, I've, I've observed and noticed if there has? But I think it, it, it is good to understand from a risk perspective and health and safety issues, so on and so forth, how the managers, uh, our officials and managers, uh, actually that structure uh, looks at risk and how it then is perceived and, and how it actually comes back. And we see that through the committee reporting, Chairman. Okay, who wants to take the, the, the sort of operational point first, I guess, in, in terms of how... Um, Lorna? In terms of operational risk, there's a, an expectation that this, this is happening, and we know it is happening because what is presented to members about investment is based on that risk assessment. What you're talking about is the clarification of when a risk is arising or it's reported, um, about the incidence of that, whether it's a pothole or, or other, other, other matters. So what we'll do, given that none of us are uh, experts in roads, that we'll ask the roads inspectors to, to set out the roads engineers to set out their their uh, processes and and help provide that clarification about how they use this in the, in their day to day jobs, if that's helpful. And in terms of the presentation to this committee, um, we reviewed the delegations um, in the intervening period. So this is where all policy comes from in terms of the council's uh, general operations. Okay, Councillor Campbell. Sorry, Chair. Um, I was just reading something else in the document there. It was just to ask a, a question. I maybe should know the answer to this, and other members do, but I'll ask anyway. Just on the last page, uh, to consider the use of risk financing brackets spend to save. What, what do we mean by that? Could, could maybe just give me a, a, a general explanation. Thanks. Okay. Risk financing? I don't really recognise that. Thank Yeah. Perhaps if one of you could help us. Sorry. Sure, I can tell you what it is, but actually the person best placed to actually speak about whether we should use risk financing is actually in the room next door. That's Paul Garrett. The issue of risk financing is whether we spend money up front to avoid a problem in the future. So as a most naive example, if we were to spend, there's always a risk, as we know, in the corporate risk register of um, say a child protection issue. If we were to spend more money on social workers or to spend money investing in our social work department, potentially could reduce that risk to a lower level. But whether that's appropriate for the council, I'm not sure. Okay, has that helped, Councillor Campbell? Yeah, clearly there's a lot of thought we'll need to, to go into this in, in the future. Um, it's, it, it's intriguing, I shall say. <laughs> Councillor Driver. Thanks, thanks very much. Yeah, maybe to help that situation is the, the, the street lighting side of things where we spend to save um, over the four year period. We saved over half a million quid on the actual improvements. And then on top of that, the electricity supply with the LED lighting. So therefore, there's a risk uh, that we have to have to that. Just, just on that, that particular uh, thing, um, Chair, uh, we've seen today that we're trying to improve a lot of policies and procedures and all that sort of thing uh, within the council, trying to be make more of a Municipal uh, Council and things like that. I'm hoping this doesn't make us risk averse as opposed to more risk aware. Because we will in the future ask probably for projects that will come along and hopefully there will be some risk in it. There's always a risk in everything that we actually do. But we will not be risk averse to actually take that, that, that opportunity on board. I do think you draw an important distinction between being aware as opposed to uh, averse. Lorna. I think Council Driver is absolutely correct in the sense that the Council will need to consider its own uh, appetite for risk, um, both at member and officer level, particularly given the challenges we face. Um, but also, I think it's been absolutely risk aware. It's understanding all that risk and what you can do to mitigate it or indeed accept it, um, if that's the, the choice of members in terms of decision making. Okay, members, if there are no further questions or comments, ah, Councillor Ferguson. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of things, and one I think might be helpful. On the surface, it looks a wee bit an overkill, but I think um, when we're talking about um, we're going through due diligence in terms of all the council reports and everything, 
risk matrix is actually very easy to insert. So because, particularly if we're doing update reports, because that then allows us to see the variance from report to report, where, you know, if the risk has improved, lessened or increased or whatever it would be, because if you look at minor and almost certain, um, uh, there's a significant number of uh, hurdles to get to get you down into the green area on you know on page two two four. Um, it doesn't take an awful lot to make it go one to the right, and all of a sudden you're into a high risk. Um, so it would be really helpful. I would suggest that if something like that could be incorporated, um, or at least give us a clue where it is. Um, and the other question is, um, I attended the seminar as a lot of others did on the, uh, the Sue Peth oh, sorry Sue White. Um, delivered quite recently, and I can't find any reference to the risk as it pertains to us, councillors. Okay, uh, certainly I recall a time when we did have um, the risk matrices outlined in some reports. I think they were, they were included um, in the past. Um, but Lorna, many Anything you can clarify on that? I mean, it's outlined in the cover report. The service risk registers will come as part of the business plan and they will be monitored and reported to service committees and they will show the movement in those risks or the assessment of officers in terms of that movement. But for individual projects, members will recall that they get an um, assessment of risk um, around uh, business case development and different things. So. There's a multitude of ways in which this is used, but what we are being clear about in this paper is that it needs to be much more evident to members. Members need to make decisions about whether they accept the risks around certain things as they proceed to decision making. And we want to make sure that that's uh, clearly embedded across all papers that come forward for strategic decision making, both at service committee and full council. I certainly welcome that. Is that uh, assist, Councillor Ferguson? Um, well, yeah, I, I don't mean we have to physically put that in, but if there could be a reference in the narrative to where we were and, you know, if it was a change for the time before, I think that makes sense. Uh, the bit I was getting at about where are the councillors in this, because the, the triangle in there of operational directorate and corporate risk, um, it doesn't then say, that, where's the decision of the decision maker? Where's, where's the risk for the decision makers um, in terms of strategy or... Uh, um, yeah. Okay, so if we could clarify that for the final draft. I think that would be, be helpful. Okay, members, um, unless there are any other questions or comments, we'll turn to the recommendations. 2.1, uh, we've been asked to review and approve the updated risk management policy statement as detailed at Appendix 1. Are we content to approve? Thank you. At 2.2, we're asked to review and re approve the updated risk management strategy as detailed at Appendix 2. Are we content with that? And at 2.3, note the action plan, Appendix 3. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, item 18 is the uh, General Data Protection Regulations, GDPR update, report by Head of Legal and Democratic Services. Uh, this report provides an overview on the data protection activities that the Council has put in place, together with future activity, to prepare and ensure compliance with the general data protection regulations. As members will know, GDPR took effect from 25th May this year, and this report summarizes the activity which has taken place to ensure that how the Council handles data complies with the new requirements, and critically, that persons or data subjects, to use the correct terminology, who engage with the Council can have clear expectations of how the Council will handle their data. Complying with GDPR is a huge task, which is certainly not finished, but clear plans are in place to map our progress to full compliance. Uh, the point was made at the recent seminar, which I regret I was unable to attend myself, but I understand was um, very helpful for members who were able to attend, um, that uh, these are very much the early days of GDPR, and we can anticipate that as organisations work through the practicalities of delivering on it, the Information Commissioner will be issuing further guidance and advice. Um, so we should expect that they will experience a, a period of adjustment and fine-tuning of practices, um, and members will have a part to play in providing feedback on that. Um, I'd certainly like to thank the staff who've been leading on the project under Rona's stewardship, in particular Avril Dickey and one of our graduate trainees, Marita Stankovic, for their Herculean efforts in getting us to this point. 
Um, Nick Evans is here to speak to the report. Um, Nick, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, nothing to add, Chair, now. Thank you, Nick. Members will go straight to questions or comments. Councillor Driver. So, so thanks very much. You know, it's just a, maybe a silly example, but you know, in, in, in our data in the Council, we have our Council website, and in that, in that Council website is names, addresses, emails, contacts for all elected members. If an elected member didn't want that information placed on the website, how would they get rid of it? Who are you seeing? Nick? Um, it's, not, it's not unusual in some councils for um, certain members not to be um, keen on having sort of personal addresses, etc. So often um, councillors will put down the town hall address or the council HQ in terms of where correspondence should be directed. Um, it's, it's not that unusual, but um, it's, it's a matter for members personally, I think. And as it happens, I believe that Edinburgh City Council has a policy whereby the, the correspondence address is simply um, the uh, Council HQ. Um, and Glasgow might be the same. Um, but I, I think that that's already a matter that's within the, the gift of the, men, uh, the, 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 the member, as it were. But, uh, Councillor Driver, are you used to come back? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy having my address plastered all over the place. You know, um, I've not got a problem with anybody finding out where I stare out like, because I'm a big boy, I can look after myself. Um, but... I think it's important to understand that maybe some, for instance, council officers that may be in that position as well, uh, email addresses, whatever. Yeah, I take the point. I'm not sure what happens with email addresses. Um, <clears throat> I guess in, in term, every, every case has to be judged on its merits, I guess, in terms of um, individual officers, but generally officers are um, contactable via their council email address or um, council contact telephone number. But there may be certain circumstances in which um, it would be appropriate that um, a certain officer's details didn't appear, but I think they would be very few and far between and each case would have to be considered on its merits. Okay, Councillor Ferguson. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I wonder if we just ask Nick, we've all got um, our signatures uh, um, on our email um, are we going to be having revised, um, suggested signatures, or, uh, digital signatures, so that um, just things like you said, you know, normally you'd have your email address, you'd have your mobile number, um, certainly wouldn't have your home address, but uh, so are we going to actually review that? Or is that the intention or are we just leaving it as it is? Certainly we're looking at um, the looking at what message goes on as the footer of emails as uh, um, a number of councils have reviewed their sort of standard wording about um, about often they refer to emails to and from the council may may be sort of requested under foi and, and sort of um, data protection legislation so we're certainly reviewing that and it would make sense to um, review the general approach when when we're in the process of doing that Okay, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Curlis. Just a general question in regards to what will be the resource implications to the Council in regard to this piece of regulation stroke leg legislation? The $64,000 question. And I'm not putting a number on it, but perhaps you may care to. I think, it, I think as, as the report says, it's the, it's the early days, but there, there certainly has been an upsurge in some of the business um, associated with the introduction of um, GDPR, for instance, um, data sharing agreements. There's a fair bit of activity on that at the moment, but um, it's all being um, catered for within existing resources. So there's no additional cost being ascertained at this at this point. But I've, as I say, it is a is early days, and we'll have to see how it pans out. You wish to come back. Please, I just I think this 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 committee in particular should be made aware if there's any case law case can appears as it will over the next couple of years that has implications on that for this council. We should be made aware of that. Yeah, it's a very fair point. We will need to keep an eye on this, and and certainly it's almost certainly going to develop as things go on, isn't it, Leader? Uh, thanks, Joe. I, I uh, attended the, the seminar last week. There's a number of other members, though not all members, were able to attend, and I've. 
to tell I, I left still slightly unclear as to what procedures I ought to follow when taking up constituents cases in future. And I think it would be helpful to members just to, to have some sort of guidance in terms of people contacting you by email, by letter, by phone or whatever. What process should you go through to ensure you're not in breach of the law in taking up that person's case? Yes, certainly one of the things we took away from um, from the seminar and um, discussion with members was um, a need for some further support for members and um, we will be um, issuing the guidance and also um, we're available to work individually with members and, and provide advice as necessary but certainly in terms of um, I think um, a lot rev rev um, revolves around um, consent when you're dealing with um, or dealing on behalf of um, constituents in terms of term it provides um, surety both for yourselves and the member of the public that you're that you're operating it on the on the basis agreed between yourselves, but. Certainly, we'll be issuing you with more guidance yeah, on that. On that note, I think the problem with that, for example, if somebody has contacted you by phone or or by letter, is that in order to get you're adding an extra stage, and somebody comes to you with a problem, you then write back to them with a mandate or whatever to say, "Can I take this up for you?" And that's adding an extra time into the you know the process of dealing with their their issues. And that that worries me a bit. The other thing I think that worries me is that the legislation is already in. We may already be in breach. I think as um, as the report identifies, as, as we've done a lot of work in terms of um, getting ready for GDPR and, and being as compliant as we can at this point, but certainly the ICO um, has assured um, authorities that there isn't a sledgehammer approach being taken at this point. They are um, content that where organizations aren't fully compliant that providing they have plans in place and, we, and we've got an action plan here um, that sets out the um, the ongoing activity that um, the ICO won't be um, taking a punitive approach but certainly we're looking to um, quickly address the issues that members raised at the seminar last week and, and a, an example we gave um, that members who were at planning um, the other week we'll be aware of in terms of it came out in in planning that um, when people have objected to planning applications that uh, in the normal course of events we would have put their name and address in the report and that obviously gives members the opportunity to identify people that they may know and need to um, uh, divulge that, that interest um, Picking up on GDPR, names aren't appearing um, now, and obviously members raised the raised the valid point that that puts them in a difficulty. And that's just an, a simple example of where there's sometimes some unintended consequences. But um, with planning, we've we've come up with a solution for members so that they will have the information they need, whilst we won't be um, transgressing the rules under GDPR. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Nicholson. I think it, um, it's a Scottish Parliament just now, are they not still discussing exactly what Elaine was talking about uh, with constituents and you know, people on right, I think there's supposed to be going to be an automatic right of consent. If somebody contacts you, then they're obviously wanting you to do something about it. So I think they're trying to get an automatic right of consent, so no mandate needed type of thing. So. I don't know how far that is or how it's going, but there was a change coming about quite soon, I think. I'm not familiar with that move, although certainly it would be sensible. It, it didn't used to be the case. I think Elaine would confirm that a mandate was always required. Um, so during my previous life as a member of staff, and, and then uh, Elaine is an elected member, a mandate was required, and, and that, was, that, that was absolute. But certainly some sort of presumed consent would be, would be immensely helpful, I think. Um, which we can find out about that. Councillor Campbell? A very quick point. Members will be aware that there's a small subgroup of councillors looking at a case management system um, for that will involve recording people's uh, personal information uh, and sensitive data. And I think it's important that, I don't know if you're involved in that, that particular project, Nick, but um, 
we need to make sure that it's mindful of the, these requirements going forward. That's a very good point indeed. I, I'm assuming that is being led by Mr. McAloran, but um, uh, it might be worthwhile just making sure these things are all tied up. Certainly, the the impact of GDPR is quite wide ranging, and um, also at the seminar we heard from Lindsay Turpey, who's our records management manager, and it sort of GDPR ties in with sort of policies we have in terms of document retention and destruction and how things are stored, etc. So there's a there's a lot of different strands to it, but yeah, we'll certainly we'll certainly pick that up. Grateful for that, and um, for the point being raised, Councillor McClellan. Thank you, Chair. It's following on from the leader's comment and Councillor Campbell. The make the where we're standing or where we sit just now, we currently have a number of cases where we've probably got very sensitive data on our um, tablets. The, that information will contain, I would say, quite in some cases complex situations um, with very detailed reports. Uh, in these reports, um, I would. I would imagine our constituents would see that information as very confidential. Now, I appreciate that the subgroup are still having to do some work and come up with an outcome, but as it stands just now, with this legislation in place, we're potentially, I would suggest, in breach because I don't think that information will be protected, and I don't think as an elected member I know what to do with that. It is sitting on my tablet, and I would imagine a number of us will be the same, we'll have very sensitive information in our possession that at this moment in time we could well be in breach of these regs. That one for Ronnie here, I think. I think uh, it's, it's just to make the point that in terms of things like that, you know, the, the data protection rules haven't actually changed that much. So you know, those rules have been in for quite some time now and, and the advice we give is that you only keep the data on, that you're given by a, a constituent for the length of time that you need to and after that you should be deleting it and, and getting rid of it. So you only keep it for as long as you have the purpose uh, to do the work that you have to do on it and then you should be you know, clearing it off your system. If that's helpful, we'll come back by all means. It's just very quickly, but um, I know that some of us were fairly new. We've only been in, in this just over a year, and some of these cases are still ongoing that we picked up last June. So it, it, there isn't really a prescriptive time on this, so it, it could be sitting in a position for quite a, quite a while. Okay, right. Well, I mean, I, I don't think you should worry. You know, if you've been given the information uh, that's sensitive and, and personal, but by the person themselves, they want you to have that, and, you, you're, and you're quite okay to have it on your system for as long as you need to do the work. It's about keeping it after and, and giving it to other people that is what this legislation's hitting at. Councillor Nicholson, if it's on the same point. Uh, well, it's not, well, it's not to do with the uh, data protection, but <laughs> um, keeping information, you was talking about there about keep it as, as long as it's needed and then delete it. But how does the council then stand with that? Because it'll still be on the ser council server where you can then go back in for, for information because I've, I've seen police doing that in evidence, you know, uh, where somebody's used a, a computer in the council for other means but, and they deleted it, but the information was still on the server so they could get that information off of there. So how does the council then stand for debt protection? Okay, who would like to do that? Barna? So in terms of the records management programme, we've already cleared out most emails, etc. So part of records management and GDPR, as Nick said, we've been doing a lot of housekeeping around that. And you're right, eh, Bonnie, that there's things not being deleted over a number of years. So there's been a, a clean out. One of the things we need to do is tackle that with members. We've been doing that with officers and part of the work and the training and support we need to do with you and the introduction of a case management system is to go through that, that process with you. But rest assured, if you delete it off your system, um, the council's not backing that up anywhere. So it, it's your network drive and, and your information that's secure to you. Officers are not in there, but we want to be able to help you to manage your information as, as a, a data controller. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know, know what you're saying about deleting information, you know, once you've dealt with a case, although unfortunately often members of the public expect you to remember all about their case. So, you know, when they come back to you two, year, two three years later, they still expect you to know it all. Um, but the other thing, 
what maybe more serious point is how does that interact with freedom of information? Because if you get a freedom of information request as to how you dealt with something and you deleted that from your records, you could be in breach of that particular legislation. I'd ask Rona for clarification on that one. Uh, the the, why, the 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 trick of freedom of information is if you don't have the information you can't give it so there's actually a benefit uh, in, in not having it because there's no there's no rule that you've got to give information that you once had you can only give what you've actually got so if you don't have it it can't be passed on so that makes sense. same Why point yeah so does that mean every name and address will be redacted when they get that information? I'm, I'm just slightly wondering if I'm going to get another set of advice <laughs> from this side, however. Let's, let's see where we go. Members may or may not recall when you approved the records management strategy, it had retention schedules. We published that, so, so it's known public data about how long we keep certain records for. So that's what we work towards in terms of retention of different types of data. So, for instance, in social work cases, that goes back considerably over decades, whereas day-to-day -day financial records, I think it's six years, looking towards Paul. So there's particular legal requirements over retention of data. That's published on our website and it's available in public, and that's what we work towards. But there is a degree of work that needs to be done to support elected members individually as individual data controllers to support you and what you wish to do and how you wish to retain your records. Okay, Councillor Ferguson, and then I think we will go to the recommendations. Um, thanks, uh, Chair. <coughs> um, Runa and our illustrious predecessor used to always say, don't create case law, follow it. So I would hate to be the person who was actually creating the, the case law in this one. And my question is around what happens when we get it wrong, um, because the, the, the cost of getting it wrong is draconian in the at the least, that would be a nice way of putting it. Um, so how do we set aside a contingency that meets the need if someone gets it badly wrong? Okay, who can answer that? Why don't you go next? I'm not necessarily sure I can answer it, but just to, just to say that... <laughs> yeah. But um, certainly there's a, I, I know the, the figure of 17 million euros, it seems to be bandied about in terms of the maximum that the uh, sanction that can be applied. But um, I think in if, if you're going to receive a fine of that level, it needs to be something like a, a Facebook um, kind of uh, loss of data or personal information or who is it um, curries the other day isn't it but certainly in terms of um, the type of breaches that the council's generally um, involved in we're, we're not talking anything like those sums but obviously as, as I've previously said we are in the early days so, so there'll be some uh, there'll be examples I'm sure coming forward over the next couple of years about levels of potential sanction. Okay, Councillor Ferguson. Um, thanks. I mean, the whole rationale for asking the question, because I knew you couldn't give me an answer, right? Nobody could, is it actually falls in with what we've just discussed in the risk register a bit earlier, is this is a perfect ex example when the risk matrix and everything else should be there. You know, it's up so that members today who are making the decision today are absolutely crystal clear what the risks are. And I think that um, that, that just impacts because quite rightly given our normal process uh, this report does not propose a change in policy it's not necessarily complete an impact assessment um no i don't think so um but we are where we are with that um so for me this is a perfect example of how, uh, what we discussed which is the previous um, agenda item sh should have come into play okay um, i th I think there might be grounds for an argument with that, but I'm conscious that a degree of levity is creeping in as it is. So I think we'll just move to the recommendations in that case. Um, we are being asked to consider the work that has been undertaken, um, which I believe we have done. Are we content with that at this point? And we'll look forward to um, future updates. Thank you, Nick. Item 19 is a Corporate Capital Investment Strategy Final Outturn 2017-18, a report by Head of Finance and Procurement. Um, 
This report provides members with details of the financial outturn position across the Council's capital investment strategy for the financial year 2017-18. Uh, the report also provides details of the outturn positions on those asset classes that report to this committee, i.e. property buildings, brackets other, and ICT business systems. Uh, Paul, Garrett and Ian Morgan are here to speak to the report. Uh, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, thank you, Chair. Nothing further to add. Is that working? It is. In that case, uh, uh, we'll go straight to questions and comments. Members? Okay. In that case, straight to the recommendations. Um, we're asked to note 2.1 through to 2.4. Are we content to note that? Thank you. Item 20 is the... Uh, Property uh, Buildings, brackets other, and ICT Business Systems Asset Class Capital Programs 2018-19 and to 2020-21. Uh, report by Director of Corporate Services. This report provides members with information on the proposed uh, Property Buildings, other, and ICT Business Systems Asset Class Capital Programs um, and seeks agreement of the proposed spend for 2018-19 to 2020-21. Uh, so we've got um, Paul McCulloch and Graham McAlorum here to speak to the report. Um, is there anything that you would like to add, gentlemen? Sorry, the, the, the building's property. Um, we've obviously got um, quite a lot of spend in the in the smarter office working um, projects, and obviously we're looking at that uh, at the moment in, in terms of making sure that we align our asset requirements uh, with our uh, need. Other than that, I have nothing to add. Okay, thank you very much. Members, any questions or comments? Okay, in which case I'm going straight to the recommendations. Um, we will over the papers. Um, we're asked to agree 2.1 funding allocations as set out in Appendix 1. Are we content to agree? Um, and 2.2 uh, funding allocations for the ICT business class, uh, sorry, business asset class program as set out in Appendix 2. Are we content to agree that? We are. Thank you very much, gentlemen. <laughs> Item 21 is proposed community asset transfer of a plot of land in Closeburn, report by Director of Communities. This report presents members with a Proposed community asset transfer of land at Castle Crescent, Closeburn, as detailed in Appendix 1. This piece of land sits within the Closeburn settlement boundary as defined within the current local development plan. Fiona Dobbin is here to speak to the report. Fiona, is there anything you'd like to add? Nothing to add to you. Thank you, members. Any comments or questions? This has been scrutinised by the Nisdale Area Committee already. Councillor Ferguson. Thanks. Um I'm actually just wondering, this is an exemplary good practice, and I'm wondering if uh, the Valley Leaf Trust would be prepared to allow it to, us to use it in, in other areas where very similar type projects come on board. I'm sure that data protection regulations permitting it's something we could ask them if they would, uh, if they would like to, uh, to, to be uh, an exemplar of good practice. Do you think that might be possible? Yeah, and I'm sure Closeburn, the group in Closeburn would be delighted by that. They've done a lot of work to get to where they are today. Okay, members, um, Councillor Charters. Can't quite see it here. What, what was the land valued at? And she was selling it for 15,000. What, what, what was it valued at, that piece of land? Through the chair, sure. it was valued at £30,000. Do you wish to come back? Yes. Um, the, the obvious question, if it's valued at £30,000, why are we selling at 15000 My understanding is that um, this is a, a hybrid between a community asset transfer and um, a uh, standard Scottish land fund um, uh, a buyout, as we would be accustomed to in the past. So 
effectively we're getting 15,000 for it rather than the one pound that we might have ended up with as uh, were a full-blown community asset transfer. Um, but I'll bow to the experts on confirmation of that. Uh, effectively, we're getting £14,999 that we might not otherwise have got had the full community okay. asset transfer well, my, process been applied. My last question then, Chairman, is uh, have we tried it? Have we advertised it on the open market? Defer for that. Yeah. Through the Chair, no, it hasn't been advertised on the open market. You wish to come back, Councillor Church? Yeah, I'm going to move to the recommendations. Members were asked to 2.1 consider. Are we content we've done that? 2.2, you note the recommendation of the Nestle Area Committee as detailed paragraph 3.7. 2.2, we're asked to agree to the community asset transfer of the land detailed in Appendix 1 for the sum of £15,000 as proposed by Nith Valley Leaf Trust. Are we content to agree that? Thank you. Item 22 is a former police station in Bacluse Square, Langham, proposed community asset transfer report by Director of Communities. This report presents members with the proposed community asset transfer of the former police station in Bacluse Square, Langham, to the Estale Foundation. The Estale Foundation is requesting the former Langham police station be transferred for the nominal sum of £1 as the social and economic benefits which the organisation will bring to the area will provide value beyond the amount at which the property has been valued. The most recent assessment of the value of the property puts it at approximately £100,000. Stuart Hamilton is here to speak to the report. Is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, nothing further to add, but happy to answer questions members may have. Thank you, members. Comments, questions. Councillor Driver. So, thanks very much, here. I think this has went through a lot of scrutiny uh, throughout the process, both by okay, council officers and, and in the El Nestil Area Committee. Uh, I'd, I'd recommend... You know, to support all the recommendations within the report. This is, again, as Andy said about the Closeburn one, this was a good practice job where people have actually followed the, the process right through. Members have been involved, community council have been involved, community groups have been involved, and there's been good community consultation with regard to this right through the, the process. And uh, happy to move the recommendations, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Driver. Councillor Carruthers. Full support what Councillor Driver is saying there, Chairman. I think it was it was the area committee, and I know the Foundation itself have done a fantastic job. Going back to what Council Ferguson said about being an exemplar in regards to the previous one, I think we could have used this just, just, just every bit as easily. So I fully support the recommendations as contained within the report, and I think as possibly even moved by Council Driver. Any other member? Go turn to the recommendations. We're asked to consider the STL Foundation's business plan, and noting also that it's been thrown into the STL Area Committee. We're content with that. 2.2, .2, we're asked to note and consider the recommendations of Andy Lester Committee in relation to the proposal. That's at 3.15 and 3.16. I take it those are acceptable. Um, and at 2.3, in recognition of the social and economic benefits of the project to the area, agreed to transfer the former police station, Baclou Square, Langham, to the Estelle Foundation for a nominal sum of £1, with the condition that if the foundation does not have the required capital funding in place for the project by 30th November 2018, and the property transfer has already been effected, then the, the foundation will reconvey the property to the council for the nominal sum of one pound. Just want to be clear that we are clear that we're agreeing that. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. You'll be very pleased to know that I have no urgent business. Thank you very much for your attendance and your input. <laughs>